Hey everyone, remember the Polar Express? Oh, I wish I didn't. The original book written by Chris Van Allsburg in the 1980s is fine. It's not for me, but between the dreamlike story and the comfy illustrations, I get the appeal. But the film? Oh, the film is like a descent into hell. There's no plot. Things just happen. Every single character has wandered right out of the uncanny valley and into your nightmares. The North Pole has been transformed into an empty industrial hellscape. There's all these little details in the cloth physics, like how the conductor's sleeves will flap in the breeze, but then this girl's pigtails are completely rigid. There's a stowaway hobo made of snow who might be a ghost. A snow boast away? One scene is edited like someone's planted a bomb in Santa's sleigh and we're about to get a Christmas light show to rival 1776. It cannot decide if it's a musical, and the few songs it does have are... not... Good. Everyone is Tom Hanks. The humans, the animals, the train, director Robert Zemeckis, and every single other person who worked on the film. In fact, you can't actually watch The Polar Express. If you try, Tom Hanks will break into your house and perform it live right in front of you. And he has such sights to show you. Also, he's doing the Joker for some reason. And the movie ends with the lead character trapped in his belief of Santa Claus for the rest of his life, which is honestly kind of horrifying. Spoilers, by the way. The film takes you through all nine circles of hell. Limbo, lust, gluttony, greed, wrath, heresy, violence, fraud, and treachery, before spitting you back into your seat with the solemn knowledge that you are never getting those hundred minutes back. All jokes aside, I really do feel that there is a sinister energy to this movie. There's something about it that is just unsettling, and it's not even the animation, although that certainly doesn't help. The cinematography and editing just screams horror. The Polar Express might be overflowing with whimsy, but it's the kind that leaks through at the onset of a nightmare, which only makes sense given the book was itself inspired by a dream. Actually no, that's wrong. I don't know where I read that, I might have just made it the fuck up, but from all I've read, it was written in a way that was evocative of trying to remember a dream after you wake up. Every interview with Chris Van and Allsberg, where he talks about the Polar Express, has him describe the process of writing it as this. But the odd thing with the Polar Express is that it felt more like a, a, uh, a recovered dream, a uh, recovered memory. This story was one draft, and, and the reason I say this seems like a kernel of truth, once again, is because it seemed like I was recovering a memory. And isn't that sort of chilling? Like someone out of a horror story remembering things from outside reality trying to creep in through dreams. Even Tom Hanks himself described the book as haunting in an interview. My friend and I watched it a little while ago, to hurt ourselves, and all through the movie we kept expecting it to turn into some Clive Barker-esque horror story, like the conductor was going to unhinge his jaw and swallow a child whole, or the non-believers were being taken to the North Pole to be sacrificed as part of some Christmas ritual. It was all done in good fun, of course, but we still somehow got jump scared by how bold the conductor is. I need Even as a kid, I found this movie off putting. Even I, the most unrepentant of train nerds, saw the trailer for the Polar Express and said, nah, I'm good. It's not completely devoid of merit, admittedly. The train is great. There are one or two fun scenes, one or two nice shots. Tom Hanks is clearly having the time of his life. Outside of the songs, the soundtrack by Alan Silvestri is fine, and the animation, while horrifying whenever there's a face on screen, does actually hold up pretty well. But I would love a raw cut of the Polar Express, because what little we get in the bonus features posted around online just isn't enough. I need to see the raw footage of Tom Hanks playing the hobo, especially if this comment from an interview with IGN is true. Quote, I kept trying to say as the hobo, what the fuck are you doing here? It was funny. Zemeckis just kept making me do it again and again and again. Then I did it once and I forgot to say fuck, and the next thing I know, it's rated G." End quote. Also according to that interview, Hanks did costume tests for every character, which means it's very likely there exists a photograph of 47-year-old Thomas Jeffrey Hanks dressed up like this. And I need it. That's the thing about the Polar Express. The story of its production is way more interesting than the actual movie. Chris Van Allsberg sold the film rights on the proviso that it not be adapted 
adapted through animation, but Robert Zemeckis thought a live action adaptation would be too cost prohibitive, saying, quote, it would cost a billion dollars instead of 160 million, end quote. And really? I don't know about that, Bob. Also, I could find no evidence of Chris Van Allsburg actually stipulating this anywhere. It's only Zemeckis, and as far as I could find, only in this BBC interview. Tom Hanks, who actually optioned the rights in 1999, didn't bring it up in any interview that I could find. I've come across articles written many years after 2004 reporting that it happened, like on Wikipedia, or this piece published on Filmcred by Vance Osteen from December 2020, but no other primary sources do, at least in none that I read. Given a lot of media reporting was still done in newspapers and magazines back then, it's possible I just can't get to anywhere else that says it. I searched up as many interviews with Chris Van Allsburg I could find because authors, being the petty bitch as we are, would absolutely bring something like that up if it were true, and he never did. Even in this interview conducted by Lauren Daly for the Boston Globe in 2021, he admits to his ambivalence toward the film, but never brings up any sort of stipulation that he wanted it done in live action. In fact, in another interview done by Reading Rockets and uploaded to their YouTube channel, he outright states that once the film rights are sold, you no longer have control over the finished product. Just watch. You aren't the captain anymore. You're just you're just someone who provided somebody else an idea, and, and, and the contracts fairly explicitly spell out just how much control you have, which is this much. Also in that interview, he goes into detail about Robert Zemeckis' decision to do the film through motion capture. But this, he wanted to make something look more like a moving drawing instead of a moving photograph. So that's why this has all been done digitally. Which is echoed by the director himself in other interviews that I've read. And for what it's worth, I agree that it would be impossible to match the look of the book in live action. Anyway, so they settled on motion capture as a compromise, but that doesn't make it an animated movie. When asked by the BBC about the film getting nominated for Best Animated Feature, Zemeckis was quick to say, quote, We're appreciative of that, although this isn't an animated film. It's digitally rendered. The acting is all acting. The directing is all directing. I see no reason why it shouldn't be considered for best picture, that would be great, end quote. So it's too cost prohibitive to do live action without rings of power money, but the film you did make isn't animated. Robert. Robbie. Rob. Bob. Bobby. Bobbit. Pick one. It cannot be both. And if the Polar Express is a live action movie, then by that metric so are video games like The Last of Us and God of War Ragnarok. This is a hill that animated films aiming for photorealism sometimes choose to die on, or at least their marketing departments do. The Lion King remake from a few years ago is a great example, as Your Movie Sucks has detailed in the research he's conducted for his critique of that movie. And I really don't get it because, and I'm sorry to break out a slur so early in the video but it has to be done, it is objectively false. I found multiple instances of this claim too. This article from Wired opens with it. Both Robert Zemeckis and producer Steve Starkey reiterate the claim in this piece by Ian Winterton too, originally published in the North Guide magazine. Also this is a complete tangent but it is so weird to see Tom Hanks talk about Final Fantasy in this article. At least Zemeckis doesn't quite go full Favreau and claim the Polar Express is live action. He suggests it's somewhere in between, deserving of its own category in the Oscars. And to be fair, the film's use of motion capture definitely deserves all the praise that it's received, almost as much as the movie deserves the accolades it won in the category of narrative padding. Because the plot is the film's biggest problem. Of course it is! The book was 30 pages long, why are you trying to adapt it into a 100 minute film? The amount of crap the filmmakers had to come up with to stretch this nightmare from a 20 minute it short into a feature length movie is just insane and none of it works. The poor kid, the girl, the hobo, the 153 second shot of a ticket flying through the air, the scene on the ice, the wander through the North Pole, the conductor going to throw the girl off the train but actually not throwing her off the train, just taking her up to the front. The Scrooge puppet, this dickhead, wait, that little shit was from the book? Oh, what's wrong with your face? Oh! All of it was added in the adaptation from book to movie, as was much of the central conflict which ultimately boils down to this dingus' existential crisis over whether or not he still believes in Santa. And while watching The Polar Express, the only thing going through my head was, man, if this is how hard the filmmakers had to try in order to form some semblance of a proper plot for 
from 30 pages of illustrations? Imagine how absolutely mangled the video game adaptations are. There are, mercifully, only two. One released for the PC, PlayStation 2, and GameCube, developed by Blue Tongue Entertainment, and another released for the Game Boy Advance by Tantalus Media, both of which called Australia home. Still call Australia home in Tantalus's case, and I'm going to talk about them a lot because I had to know. I had to open up that puzzle box and see the sights inside, and now you get to share in this cursed knowledge too. You're welcome. You know, Blue Tongue Entertainment sounds kind of familiar. I wonder what else they did. Oh. I can't get away from you, can I? Anyway, winter might be on the other side of the world at the time of uploading, but where I'm sitting right now, it's the height of summer, and there is no better time to explore hell. But before I get my hanks into the toms of these games, if you like the content and want to support the channel, please like, subscribe, share the video around, and let me know what you think of it down in the comments. It helps out a lot, and I'd really appreciate it. Far out, that was a long intro. Let's get to it. One of the biggest questions I had going into these games is where do you even start? It's not like the movie throws you into the action. The Polar Express shows up within the first 10 minutes, but aside from the engine appearing out of the fog, it's a very low energy introduction. And again, that makes sense given it's based on a picture book intended to be read to children before they go to sleep. You don't want something high octane to keep them awake and reading or scared. There's no way to turn this into an interesting introductory level, so so Blue Tongue and Tantalus didn't even bother. The first levels of both games pick up the plot 10 minutes into the film, when the conductor arrives threatening to punch a hole in your face if you don't have a ticket, but that's not actually where they begin. Before you even reach the main menu of the PC game, you have to sit through an extremely crunchy, extremely letterboxed clip from the film of Chris. Yes, that's his actual name, he's a self-insert. So I started out with this child, me, Eight. The little Chris was wearing a, a bathrobe that came undone and... Waking up to the arrival of the Polar Express, you can really tell this is from a different era of gaming. Just look at those black bars. They did not make this with widescreen in mind. This is hardly the first tie-in game to make use of clips from its original film to serve as cutscenes. Finding Nemo did it too from memory, and I can't even blame the developers for doing it because yeah, I'd probably do it too. And if you really loved the Polar Express before it came out on VH or DVD, you could always jump into the game to relive a little bit of the movie. Although, if you are a fan of the film, you'll notice pretty quickly they've taken some liberties with the source material. Blue Tongue have butchered this film in the editing room, and I'm not even talking about how they've adapted it through gameplay. That's a whole other can of worms. I'm talking about these clips specifically. Sometimes they do it really well, to the point where you can barely tell there was an edit. This opening clip excises the entire opening scene from the moment Chris opens his eyes to the arrival of the Polar Express, and you know what? Nothing of value was lost. But then they immediately ruin it by cutting from Chris in his bedroom to him running out into the street to see the train in a really awkward and ugly way that makes it clear something has gone wrong in the editing room. Look at it. He goes from on the bed to the door. Instantly. It's so clunky, and it's only going to get worse from here. Oh, you are not prepared for some of the shit in store further down the line. But what shits me off the most about this clip is that by cutting the shot of Chris's coat pocket catching on the bedpost, not only have the developers just completely fucked the editing of the scene, they've also chosen to ignore the only character arc in the movie before we've even reached the main menu. Sure, it wasn't great in the movie to begin with, but it's the only source of conflict we had, and it's already gone! Blue Tongue! You cannot do this! The menu itself is fine, it's framed as a book, it's pretty robust, it's fine, it's just fine. Ooh, bonus content! I wonder what that is! Disappointing, no doubt! The Game Boy Advance title's main menu is much better in my opinion. You don't have to sit through some butchered movie clip, and you actually get to see the train riding through the snowy countryside. The sprite work is better than it has any right to be, especially given they don't reuse this version of the Polar Express at any other point in the game other than the main credits. Tantalus did not have to go this hard, but they did, and I'm so happy for it. Wait, is that? Aurora Borealis! 
The only real similarity between the menus is that you get to name your own profile. Another surprising similarity between the two games is that they're really easy to get running. Call me the engineer's forehead because that segue was slick, with sweat, yuck. Obviously I played the GBA game on an actual and very real Game Boy Advance, which is why I had no troubles there. Obviously. Ignore that. Anyone who mentions that is getting coal for Christmas. But I approached the PC game expecting to waste days trying to get it working only to discover it ran without issue. It's honestly kind of disgusting that shovelware garbage like the Polar Express is able to run on modern hardware flawlessly, when games people might actually want to play like Tomb Raider, Hitman 2 Silent Assassin, Thief, and Trespasser require whole guides and multiple fan patches Frankenstein together just to fucking open. It's a disgrace and an injustice, but we don't have time to dwell on it. We've got a train to catch. Hit new game and you're slapped in the face with another crunchy movie clip squeezed onto the size of a postage stamp and Blue Tongue has already given up on continuity editing. It starts out alright with Chris meeting the conductor in the street but then it just smash cuts to him getting harassed by this little shit in his seat like it's a fucking jump scare. It takes until the train reaches Herple Shimers for the first scrap of in-engine game to even appear and they introduce it with a giant Scrooge puppet chanting the word Herpless Shimers, Herpless Shimers! <laughs> What the fuck game? You need to slow down. I'm dying here. Just watch this shit. Bah! I can't stand children. They're the only ones silly enough to believe in Santa. It's toys that make Christmas fun, not Santa. Now, when I first watched the Polar Express, I thought Herpelsheimers was a fucking nonsense word. It sounds like it should be a shibboleth, but it is in fact the name of a department store in Grand Rapids, Michigan that operated from 1865 to 1987, and it's one of those little period and regional details about the movie that help ground it in a place and time that I actually genuinely like. Same as the hobo's antiquated slang. It lets you know the movie is set in the 1950s, or at least not in the 1970s when the place was rebranded to Herpes. Sorry, Herps. You know, somehow that's even worse. I bring this up not because it's a fun fact, it absolutely isn't, but because as a department store at Christmas time, the kids are probably going crazy for all the cool expensive toys it has to sell. So why is Scrooge going on about how kids are the only ones silly enough to still believe in Santa? This is a train full of boomers. They're going to run the world into the fucking ground at the altar of capitalism when they grow up, and they're already chomping at the bit to spend big at the mere mention of a department store. Scrooge already has what he wants. That little shit says as much in the following cutscene. I want all those Herpesheimer's toys. I'm gonna ask Santa for all of them. But I guess the game needs to have some sort of conflict, and that conflict needs to have some sort of villain, and that villain needs to have some sort of motivation, and challenging the hero's belief in Santa that he's already kind of lost is better than nothing. It's just done so awkwardly. They toss out the setup for Chris's existential crisis in the opening cinematics, and then have to reel it back in as soon as the game actually starts, so they can staple it to a conflict. But what I love most is that Scrooge already has all of their tickets, all but one. Every single kid except Holly, yeah the girl's name is Holly, was too busy staring out the window at Toy Santa from the Santa Claus 2 that he was able to swoosh in and pickpocket the lot of them. A true Scrooge. Ebenezer would be proud. <laughs> and they'll never find these tickets before the conductor throws them off the train. <laughs> Let's put a pin in Scrooge McPuppet for now because we need to move on. And the rest of this cutscene is pure gold. Tickets? Tickets, please. I'll be coming back to check your tickets shortly. Make sure you have them ready. I never lose my ticket. I always keep it here, safe in my pocket. My ticket, it's gone! You stay here and keep an eye out for the conductor. I'll go and help find their tickets. Man, they really don't make games like this anymore, do they? So here we are, we finally have control of the game, and you know what? I can't believe I'm saying this, 
but I don't hate it. These graphics never looked good, even at the time of release, but now they've got a retro charm that I can't help but like, and there is something satisfying about getting the chance to run wild up and down the Polar Express. One of the only good things about tie-in video games is getting to wander out of frame and explore a set like it's a real place. It's one of the things I've most enjoyed about the better Jurassic Park games. It's like the only thing I enjoyed about Lost Via Domus. And as much as I dislike the Polar Express, Blue Tongue did a good job of rendering the train and its crowd of also-ran passengers into a digital space. It's actually kind of fun to explore, but only for these two cars. The rest of the train can go fuck itself for reasons I'll get into in just a moment. I also really like that you can switch the camera angle at the touch of a button, so you're not forced to run back at the screen if you turn around to look for something. You can use it to reveal secrets hidden around each car too. It's well implemented and it deserves a better game. The only thing you'll really find around the starting area are some coins which give you extra continues for every 20 you collect, and a broken toy part. These things are hidden throughout the game, and if you collect enough to rebuild each toy, you'll unlock a bonus feature. Ooh, I wonder what those are. Disappointing, no doubt. You might also notice Chris's bathrobe billows and flutters in a familiar way if you've ever played a Harry Potter game. I haven't touched a transphobic wizard game in many years, but I swear it looks like it's the exact same animation. And given Warner Brothers published both, I almost wonder if Blue Tongue just asked for the robe physics code and crowbarred it into the Polar Express to save themselves some time. A true Christmas miracle if ever there was one. Unfortunately, once you've finished exploring the two cars at the back of the train, you have have to move on, and it's not good. As we've already seen in the opening cinematics, Blue Tongue struggled to find any sort of conflict to frame their Polar Express video game around, so they just said fuck it. The great puppet war it is. All the kids who lost their tickets have moved further up the train, but Scrooge McPuppet has already blocked the path back with an army of spooky jack-in-the-boxes and jigsaw wannabes that act as the only regular enemies in the game. Well. The Jack in the Boxes do. We're never gonna see Jigsaw again after this car. They're not even given a proper introduction. Scrooge is present for the first car, but there isn't any sort of confrontation between him and Chris. He just fucks off and you're left to very casually walk past the obstacles he left behind. It's not like it's challenging. The camera is a little cramped, but if you're not stopping to check every nook and cranny for a coin or a toy part, you'll be past it in moments. Don't look at that. But dodging Jack in the Boxes is just to the start. You've got to find the right jack-in-the-box to get Elf Boy's ticket back. And do it before he runs off like a coward. You've got to kick balls at these guys and lock them in their baskets. You have a full-on food fight with Scrooge's army in the dining car to get this little shit's ticket back. And this is all within the first 15 minutes of the game. It's like the game is terrified you'll get bored and turn it off if it slows down for even a moment. So it just throws everything it can think of at you as quickly as possible. None of it is all that challenging. Don't look at that. But none of it is engaging either. What little enjoyment there is to be had comes from how fucking bonkers it is. How quickly it pinballs from set piece minigame to set piece minigame without stopping to breathe, I can relate. It's not even an issue if you fail because you'll just respawn directly where you died unless you run out of continues, but the game is so generous with those that you'd really have to go out of your way to use them all up. There's not even any skill involved. The game aims all of its projectiles for you, so whether you're free kicking soccer balls into bars Skits in this car or locked to the x-axis during the battle in the dining area, all you have to do is stand in the right place and hit the button at the right time to win. There's no risk of failure at all in the car with Elf Boy. If he runs off, all you have to do is go and get him, then you can start again. Hey, why did you run off? I can't open the toys without you. It's too scary. I don't want to go back in there. I'm pretty sure I know which toy it's in. We'll find it in no time. Okay, I'll give it one more shot. This right here is the only other good thing about the game. The sound design and the voice performances. The music isn't some synthetic copy of the film's soundtrack, but an original score composed by Stephen Schutz and recorded specifically for the game by an actual orchestra, the Melbourne Symphonic, and it fucking rules.
Now contrast that with some of the lowest effort voice acting and sound design I've ever heard in a video game. Just fucking listen to it. <laughs> Hey, what are you doing here? Well, I came to help you look for your ticket. Obviously. I know where my ticket is. There's a gang of nasty puppets in there, and they've refused to give it back. I'm not afraid of some old puppets. I'll go in there and get your ticket back for you. The puppets going ooh and ugh are one thing, but the children, holy fuck the children. But the absolute king of the Polar Express's voice cast has to be James Method Hanks, Tom's younger brother and perennial impersonator. His Scrooge is incredible. Well, they certainly won't believe in Santa if they never reach the North Pole. And they won't reach the North Pole if they don't have tickets for the Polar Express. <laughs> and they'll never find these tickets before the conductor throws them off the train. You have to get past my puppets if you want that ticket. Not even close. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's plenty more where that came from. But the best is yet to come because one of his lines is so good, it's genuinely up there with the blessed worm from Men in Black <coughs> in terms of auditory erotica. No! It's the noise Scrooge makes whenever he takes damage during his boss fight, and it's so good I actually went into the options menu and turned off the music to get a clean recording of it. No! We can end the section on the game's sound design right here. We're never going to top that, although there is some stiff competition, at least in the Blue Tongue game. I'll touch on the GBA title sound design when we get to it, if we get to it, because we're still not done with the Great Puppet War. After you get this little shit's ticket back and he's a little shit about it. Don't you know it's against railway regulations to throw objects inside the train cars? Well, they started it and it was the only way I could get your ticket. The game fades out and this happens. Putting aside that this cutscene is pre-rendered rather than in-engine for reasons I do not understand, and the fact in this version of the story Billy, My name is Billy. is so poor the conductor doesn't even stop the train for him, and that all of this happened off-screen, and that all of this has been crowbarred into five minutes worth of the movie, the continuity of space is completely off. Before the cutscene Chris continues toward the engine from the dining car, five up from the observation car at the rear of the train, but the next we see of him in the cutscene, he's somehow back in the passenger car one up from the observation car, and he's walking toward it. Did you just forget about the rest of the kids and their tickets? Fuck em, I guess, along with everyone else if the conductor catches you pulling the emergency brake. Then after the cutscene ends, we're in the basket car for a boss fight. 
<laughs> I'm afraid he's going to be left behind all alone on Christmas Eve. <laughs> You're going to have to get past me if you want to pull this emergency brick. And I don't believe that you can do it. Do you? <laughs> God, look at those dead eyes. This kid is fully prepared to murder this fucking puppet. Scrooge has no idea who he's dealing with. It's just the same soccer ball shooting gallery from before, only it's so much better because Scrooge goes, No! No! When you hit him, the only slightly annoying thing about it is how the balls all hang back at the other end of the car. So you have to run all the way down the aisle to grab one, and then all the way back up again to kick it, but it's over in moments. Get fucked, you stupid puppet. And it's here, at last, that we get another clip from the movie, specifically of Chris pulling the brake cord and Billy climbing on board. It's not even edited, it's just a full uninterrupted 95 seconds straight from the movie. The only continuity error comes from Chris somehow having teleported back to the passenger car yet again from halfway up the train. But do you know the funniest thing about this whole little set piece? Is that because it takes so long to pull the brake cord and Billy caught up immediately, you know he was chasing that train like a motherfucker. The Polar Express is based on the Pierre Marquette 1225, which according to American Rail's com has a top speed of 113 kilometers per hour. That's 70 miles per hour already. But as Holly points out, it's a magical train. It goes from Grand Rapids, Michigan to the North Pole and back in the space of five real-time minutes. This kid has crazy legs! Also, yes, the real-life inspiration for the Polar Express has the date for Christmas Day in its name, at least if you go by month, day, year. But from all I've read, that appears to be a coincidence. Incidents. It's also not true that the train from the book is based on this particular locomotive. It was chosen specifically for the film, as is stated on the website of Pierre Marquette 1225's current operators, the Steam Railroading Institute. It's actually had quite the revival since the film's release. It even offers legally distinct North Pole Express rides in November and December. I can only imagine that they're just as exciting as these games. But what I found most interesting is that on the page regarding the train's history, it mentions it was put on display at Michigan State University from 1957 to 1969. Nice. During which time Chris Van Allsburg actually played on it as a child. This is a well-known fact associated with a well-known quote thanks to it being on Wikipedia. The source cited is an article from a print edition of the Detroit Free Press, and the only archived copies I could find were behind paywalls, so they'll just have to keep their secrets. But Van Allsburg does mention it in that interview from the Boston Globe I referenced before, so it seems to be true. Incredible indeed. We still gotta find the rest of the tickets. What do you fucking mean? And then we're just halfway up the train again. Why was that cutscene pre-rendered? Why did the audio desync? You keep looking for the tickets and I'll distract the conductor. All right, you've got a deal. It feels like that entire boss fight was added at the last minute when someone on the dev team went, shouldn't we introduce Billy if he's going to be important later on? And everyone had a collective meltdown to bash it together over a weekend. It's a scene that feels bolted on to smooth out a continuity error that doesn't exist, because you could cut Billy out of the game and virtually nothing would change. But game development being what it is, I know it can't be. And then it just dumps you back where you were to continue what you were doing before. You know what? Fuck it. Scrooge is dead, but the Great Puppet War continues. But first, how about a game of tennis with a jack-in-the-box? I don't even think he's trying to stop us. I think he just wants to hit the court for a bit. You look like a good sport. The ticket you're looking for is on the other side of this train car. If you can get the ball past me, then you can pass. Let's play! And what do you even say? It's just tennis. Played with a dinner tray capable of serving balls out of nothing, but still, just tennis. There's no way you'll win. Game, set, and match, you stupid puppet. After the... Uh 
tennis car? You come to the kitchen car, and for once it's not a puppet on the warpath. The cook has the ticket of this kid with the Innsmouth look, and he won't let anyone into the kitchen to retrieve it. Honestly, given my blood pressure rises every time anyone so much as looks at the kitchen while I'm cooking, I don't really blame him. This man has done nothing wrong. Also, what are you doing on the Polar Express? You should be off worshipping Mother Hydra. Anyway, of course you have to sneak through the kitchen to get the ticket, and it's just as basic a set piece as all the rest. It feels like a tutorial for a stealth mechanic with how narrow the area is, but no, this is all the sneaking you'll ever do in this game. You don't even have to try, you can literally just walk past the guy and he won't notice. But the best part is, if you fail after collecting the ticket, he takes it back off you before booting you out of the kitchen to try again. What a petty bitch, I love it. You! That was close! He sure is in a bad mood. Here's your ticket. Never do that again. Scandal, I'm busy. What follows is four more train cars of minigames. You have to play Asteroid with ice blocks, you have to throw toys at more Jack in the Boxes, you have to catch wind-up mice and yeet them into baskets. Actually, this one's not too bad. After a certain point, Chris decides all puppets must die, picks up a hammer and chooses violence. It's so much thrown at you so quickly, you're given no time to engage with any aspect of it. As soon as you get used to what's going on in one car, you're bumped into the next area to do something completely different. There's nothing even worth talking about gameplay wise in any of these sections because there's barely any gameplay at all. You have a timer on the mouse roundup, but even at only 60 seconds, it is extremely generous. The smaller ice blocks in the asteroid car won't hurt you, in fact they'll disappear if they bounce into you, so there's not even any reason to focus on keeping the area relatively clean of obstacles. As before, the game does all the aiming for you when it asks you to throw things, and when Chris finally decides enough is enough and picks up a hammer, you don't even need to wait for the jack-in-the-boxes to pop up to hurt them. You can just smash them all to bits the second you regain control. The most distinctive things about these minigames are all presentational, like the truly fantastic animations of Chris diving face first to the floor, trying to catch a wind-up mouse to then throw it underarm into a basket, or the constant grinding noise that plays throughout the ice-breaking minigame that sounds like a giant wasp trying to drill into your skull. And of course, the cutscenes are just unhinged. Promise me you won't laugh. I won't laugh. Some horrible little mice ran off with it. I'm really scared of mice. <laughs> hey, you said you wouldn't laugh. What are you doing all the way up here? I came up here to help you find your ticket. I fought puppets, dodged toys, smashed ice blocks, trapped mice, and even hid from an angry cook. Whoa! Now that's impressive! Hey! You'll never believe it, but those mice were only wind-up toys. You shouldn't be scared of toys. Toys? Let me guess. Those toys in there, they won't give you your ticket. That's right! They jump up and threaten me whenever I enter the room. Leave it to me. Wait a minute! I think I see my ticket! It's there, frozen in a block of ice! We'll need something to break the ice apart. Use that ice smasher thing. An ice smasher? That sounds cool. I want to try that. Okay. I don't think we'll be having any more trouble from those toys. They'll stay shut for a long time. We should go back and join the others. Yup. We better get back before the conductor throws us off the train. Bastard boy, messing up my plans! Wait, you're not dead? Also, what the fuck is this? That's a frame from the beginning of the movie, what is it doing here? It flashes again at the end of this cutscene too, did no one test this? Okay, it doesn't matter, we need to move on. We've been in the second circle for way too long. Somehow, Scrooge has returned, and he's got one last trick up his sleeve. Let's see what happens to the girl when she realizes she's lost her ticket! <laughs> They'll never find it here. No. No, game, no. No, you can't be serious. Okay. 
we need to pause for a moment. If you've seen the film, you understand why this is such a violation of continuity. But if you haven't watched it, or just don't remember, allow me to clarify. Remember that 153 second shot of a ticket going on a magical journey I talked about in the introduction? That happens because Holly leaves her ticket behind on her seat for reasons that do not fucking matter here, because the game just full on fucking cut them out. Actually, that's a lie. They are in the game, but they're not here. Anyway, then Chris loses the ticket trying to return it to her instead of just, you know, waiting for her to come back, and after two and a half minutes the stupid thing ends up stuck in a vent in the same car where he lost it in the first place. And it's only now, 21 minutes into the movie, after checking every ticket the second anybody boards, that the conductor asks for Holly's. But of course she doesn't have it, and these tickets are not transferable. So he goes to throw her off the fucking train, except not really. And of course it's only then that Chris notices the ticket in the vent and is able to proceed to the third circle of hell. Now, I'm not going to defend the original interpretation of the scene because it is a 153 second narrative dead end that only exists to fill time and justify this shot from the book. I don't even think it makes sense spatially, never mind the avalanche of coincidences it takes to get the ticket back into the passenger car. But at least it isn't this. At least it isn't Scrooge McPuppet back from the dead having somehow pickpocketed Holly while everyone's back was turned hiding her ticket in an air vent halfway up the fucking train from where Chris will find it as soon as this next cutscene ends. I don't know why I'm complaining, it feels like everyone teleports back to the passenger car every time the camera fades out. It's just such a mangling of continuity. Yep, there it is. Fuck me. And again, the movie clip is just an uninterrupted minute of film footage. It's only after Chris finds the ticket that they start editing out shots, including the moment where he notices the silhouette of the conductor and Holly on the roof of the observation car. So how the fuck does he even know they're up there in this version? Now that I'm thinking about it, if the conductor is just taking her up to the front of the train anyway, why is he taking her across the roof? Where's the fucking brake cord? I wanna get off. I wanna fucking get off, let me off the fucking train! The whole time I was playing the PC version, I was thinking the GBA title cannot be this bad. And to its credit, it isn't. The Tantalus game is a 2D side-scroller with, and you're not gonna fucking believe this, actual mechanics. It's not just a travelling circus of mini-games. There is a game to play here, and all they had to do to make it work was completely ignore the license. It's still not very good, as we will soon see, but after the insanity of the Blue Tongue version, I'll fucking take it. They do more or less start the same way, but there's not enough space on the Game Boy Advance cartridge to fit 20 minutes of crisp clean 240p film footage, so instead of the occasional film clip, we get a slideshow. I kind of love how low effort they are too. All of the characters have little portraits to indicate who's speaking, and you can tell the pictures have been grabbed from the first frame of film that features them clearly, so you end up with moments like this, where the portrait is identical to the slideshow, and it's just... It's just a lot. The Polar Express. What's hilarious is that this slideshow is actually more faithful to the film than the nightmare roller coaster of the Blue Tongue game's opening levels. It's only 55 seconds long, but it covers the first 14 minutes of the movie in such a succinct way that nothing feels off about it. Everyone is introduced with the same low energy of the film. The train actually stops for Billy, and like in the film, he only decides to board after it starts to leave. And better yet, the game actually shows you this. Pulling the brake cord is your first objective in the game. There are no tickets to find, no great puppet war to fight, no mini games to suffer through. The only thing truly lost is another cameo from Purple Shimers. Oh and I guess Billy still has crazy legs to keep up with the train for so long. But at least that's pretty much off screen. And then you're just in the game. There's no big cutscene, no awkward dialogue. You're given complete control in less than a minute and as with the Blue Tongue game, I don't hate it. It doesn't do as good a job of recreating the Polar Express as a digital playground, but it still looks pretty decent for a Game Boy Advance title. I really like the rattle of the train and the occasional whistle as ambient noise, and the way the snowy forest scrolls past the windows in the background does evoke the sensation of movement. <laughs> The way you shift from indoors to outdoors when running between cars is pretty jarring though. 
The controls are pretty tight as well, though in this first level they're interrupted every other second by a tutorial pop-up, which is not a great way to introduce so many mechanics in quick succession. It doesn't really ease the player into the game, it just hits pause on everything over and over again in a really clunky way. It makes the game seem way more complicated than it actually is, but aside from the pop-ups, the first level does a pretty good job of preparing you for the rest of the experience. It's a very basic side scroller with a very basic move set of run, jump, long jump, grab to pull or push, duck and crawl. Hot chocolate restores any lost health, naturally, though you can waste it by picking it up at a full free hearts. There are candy canes to collect scattered all over the level, you can create checkpoints by running past these Christmas trees, and you can get extra lives by picking up your own disembodied head, which is... Odd, not gonna lie. But your real goal in this level, in pretty much every level for that matter, is to find free bells from Santa's sleigh and unlock an exit. Normally the exit comes in the form of a fancy door that will tell you how many bells, if any, you have left to collect. But in this first level, the bells actually unlock the way to the emergency brake at the back of the train, which is a nice little touch. In this first level, it is exceptionally easy to find all the bells. They're all just sitting out in the open. It's still not challenging. The obstacles of luggage racks and steam vents are all very simple to avoid, but unlike the Blue Tongue game, here it's by design. It's a decent opening level, and best of all, the train actually stops when you pull the brake. Nice detail. I enjoy. It's at this point you get your first glimpse at the level select screen and oh fuck me. When I first saw this game had 960 candy canes to collect I died a little inside because it's such a fucking absurd number. It lets you know you're in for a slog too because even at 30 canes a level that's 32 missions in total and call me crazy but I don't believe the Polar Express has enough story for that much game and if we're going to go for such a stupid number of collectibles just rounded up to 1,000. 960 is such a weird number to stick to, unless you collect 40 bells across the game. Anyway, I saw that and I didn't want to do it, but I couldn't not collect them all, could I? I was too scared the conductor would climb out through the screen and shove a lump of coal down my throat if I didn't 100% the game. I didn't want to miss one and find out at the end of the game you can't unlock the good ending without it, so I resigned myself to my fate and jumped into episode 2-1 to continue the game. Yeah, the game is divided into episodes with a number of sub-chapters depending on where you are in the story. Episode 2's cutscene really brings into focus how unhinged the conductor is in every version of the story. He still blows a gasket over having the emergency brake pulled, but then immediately switches to hot chocolate mode with no segue. Here he doesn't even cool down when Chris and Holly explain he pulled the brake to let Billy board the train. He's just like, no more emergency stops. Now who would like some refreshment? He seemed pretty dismissive of Billy to begin with. I'm starting to think he wishes he had the balls of the blue tongue conductor who just left the kid behind without even stopping the train. I've got a schedule, you know. But then he's also the one to suggest taking some hot chocolate to Billy after the fade back in, which leads to Holly leaving her ticket behind and Chris losing it while trying to cross between cars. And mate, I don't think you're getting it back. I think it's just gone. Like the hot chocolate song, which of course Tantalus cut, because how the fuck do you adapt that scene into a 2D platformer? Is it just me or does this thing look like a xenomorph? Hang on, that gives me an idea. Ha <laughs> yes! Before we get into episode 2, let's talk about the GBA game's sound design. I definitely didn't say that I would and then forgot. I'm definitely not recording this after everything else in the video. Shut up. Truth be told, there's not much to say. The ambience is great like I've already mentioned. As far as the sound effects go, they're stock but fine. <laughs> But the music. That's what made this game unbearable in the end. That was my death by a thousand cuts. It doesn't start off that way. The Christmas jingles littered throughout the game are fine to listen to once or twice, but after over two hours of having them drilled into my brain, I never wanted to hear another sleigh bell again. It's not like each level gets its own track, they get reused across multiple missions back to back to back, and it's so repetitive. They really need 
needed more music for this one. They've got a weird nightmare quality to them as well, like they should be playing in a horror game rather than a kid-friendly 2D platformer. Just listen to them. <laughs> Episode 2 consists of a pair of levels set around the same sort of basic Polar Express environment. They do introduce the last couple of game mechanics though, and they are doors you can enter and toy boxes filled with power-ups. The doors function as they do in any 2D side-scroller, they allow for a little more complexity in the level design, but here in episode 2 they're just used to create a couple of side rooms you need to explore to collect bells. The power-up toy boxes are more interesting, but they always only ever give you one kind of item, and they never run out. A toy box that gives you a magic wand will always give you a magic wand, just like the toy box that gives you a sock will never give you anything else. Given the power-ups are often necessary to complete any given area, this is a good thing. It avoids any chance of a soft lock, but it does make them very boring. Why even have the toy boxes at all when you could just have each item as something you can pick up, or at least change the colours of the toy boxes around to indicate what item you'll get? That some of the boxes hand out socks makes me think there was originally meant to be some element of randomness to to them, but Tantalus had to change the mechanic around when more obstacles in later levels started to be built around certain power-ups. As it is, it's fine, but none of the power-ups are particularly useful, or at least they aren't here. The first you'll find, the magic wand, is just a star from Super Mario. It even turns Chris gold and has its own little jingle. <laughs> It lasts for such a short amount of time that it's only useful if you can find one right next to an obstacle. The next power-up is introduced in episode 2 too, and it's a pogo stick. As you might expect, it allows you to jump really high, but it requires a bit of timing on the player's part because it will only bounce if you hit the button as it touches the ground. Miss the beat and the pogo stick will bounce back into the toy box in disgust. It's the most mechanically engaging power-up not just because it requires some actual skill from the player to use, but because it can also be used to break blocks of ice and take you places you wouldn't normally be able to reach. It's also really funny if you manage to get one under a low ceiling. An existential crisis will be the least of Chris's worries by the time he gets to the end of this hallway. Should have asked Santa for a helmet because wow that's a lot of head trauma. It also makes the transition between indoors and outdoors even more jarring because the pogo stick doesn't change colour, it just stays the same shade of red. Oh god, they turned Rudolph into a pogo stick! Episode 2 2 also introduces buttons you have to cover in order to open doors, which is fine, it's fine. In fact, that's how I'd describe most of this game. It's just fine. It's not great, it's not bad, it lacks the insanity of the blue tongue version, but that doesn't make it boring, at least here. It is perfectly adequate, and at least your foray onto the roof in episode 2 too adds a little visual variety to the level. Though Tantalus has already started putting candy canes in obtuse locations like terraces you have to crawl through, or beneath platforms walled in by movable boxes, which does not bode well for the future. It's almost like 960 is too many collectibles for a game of this length. Oh my god, we still have 870 left. 
Episode 3 begins with a moment of insanity you'd expect more from the Blue Tongue game than the Tantalus title. For one thing, Chris didn't even find Holly's ticket at the end of Episode 2, so the conductor just takes her away to throw her off the train, as in the movie. Except not really. The GBA game does reinstate the meeting between Chris and Billy in the observation car after finding the ticket in the vent, and also his realisation that the conductor is taking Holly across the roof. But then it completely fucks everything by smash cutting to his meeting with the hobo without even showing Chris climbing on top of the car. I really hate that they chose a frame of the hobo holding the ticket too, because unlike in the film, it's never explained how it got back into the passenger car, much less the air vent given it blew away into the darkness. So Tantalus could have just had Chris chase the conductor to stop him from throwing Holly off the train, except not really, only to stumble across this weirdo with the ticket already in hand. It would still be dumb. It would still be massively contrived. It wouldn't make sense that the conductor and Holly missed him on the way across, but it would at least make sense within the context of what we've seen in this version of events. The ticket even hits him in the movie when it gets sucked under the train. You could have just said he grabbed it then. These are easy, obvious solutions to plot holes. Why are you making it harder for yourselves? What frustrates me most about this scene is that none of the hobo's bombast comes through in the dialogue, and the few times it does try to directly quote the film, it gets the lines wrong. So, let's go find that dame. We go straight from Chris meeting the hobo to them getting ready to ski down the length of the Polar Express too, which does admittedly trim some fat, but is undeniably awkward in execution. The hobo deciding to help Chris out feels almost natural in the film, in as much as anything in this nightmare could be considered natural. But here it's like it comes out of nowhere. At least the level that follows is a break from the usual bell collecting. Also, I'd like to point out we just went over 9 minutes of the movie in 40 seconds. Wow. Anyway, episode 3 consists of one level, an auto-scroller where you ski across the roof of the Polar Express. All you have to do to avoid obstacles is jump over them or duck under them. The train never goes up or down a hill, the plane stays flat and the speed stays static throughout, although that doesn't mean it's not challenging toward the end. If there's one thing Tantalus understands, it's a difficulty curve, and this level is pretty much the whole game in microcosm in that regard. It's probably a lot easier if you're just out to survive, but I went out of my way to collect every single candy cane. So there. It looks nice at least. As with the other levels, the way the background scrolls past creates a sense of speed and movement. I like the way you skate into the tender at the end of it too. However, the train has way too many cars. They tried to hide it by making them extra long, but there are 14 cars in total, which is not the same amount you end up playing through. The Polar Express from the film has five cars, not counting the engine or the tender, except for the shots where it suddenly has up to 19 out of fucking nowhere. So if anything, it's also not enough cars. I swear, every time I think I've found all the weird little problems with this movie, it takes it as a personal challenge. Wait, how many cars does the book version have? I can't tell. It looks like 12, but I can't fucking tell. Don't fucking tell me that means the Blue Tongue game has the most consistent Polar Express. Please don't let that be true. One, two, three, Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. You travel back through the train later in the game and the order's consistent there too. Oh no. Speaking of the Blue Tongue game, where were we? Oh yes, the conductor was going to throw Holly off the train. You know, watching it back, I realise the conductor never says he's going to do that. It's this little shit who insists that's what he's doing. So him not immediately throwing her under the wheels isn't actually a plot hole. However, that does open up several other questions such as why he's taking her across the roof to get to the engine when they could just, you know, walk through the train like he does at every other point in the movie. Gotta love this awkward cut at the end of the film clip too. You couldn't give the scene a few extra frames to breathe. That girl was depending on me. I'm not going to let her down. The next level is set on the roof of the train. You have to move up the cars of the Polar Express in pursuit of the conductor and Holly to return her ticket. So if any moment of the game is going to tell us how long the train is, this is it. Like in the GBA title, all you can do to avoid getting hit is jump and duck, but the three-dimensional plane adds so much more complexity to what is otherwise the exact same minigame. 
Obstacles come flying at you from every direction, and aside from the icons in the middle of the screen, there's very little indication of where to go to avoid getting hit. Even then, they usually pop up too late to be of any help, because Chris handles like wet garbage on a hot summer's day. When you get into the rhythm of the stage and start bouncing across the top of the train dodging obstacles left, right and centre, it's actually fun. But it's a lot more entertaining to fail because... <laughs> just fucking look at it. I got a second into the level before a water tower swatted me off the back of the train, and it only got funnier from there. Oops. If you fuck up bad enough, the game will throw you back all the way to the observation car, and that is a fret. It was so hard trying to count the cars, because I kept getting thrown back so much, but I am certain there are more than 12, thus making it just as inconsistent as every other incarnation of the Polar Express. I don't think it even matters if you do well anyway. There's this little gauge at the bottom of the screen to indicate how far away the conductor and Holly are from you, and while it never stops moving, I don't think it matters how close you manage to get, because as soon as they reach the engine, the level just ends anyway. I'm pretty sure you could hang off the back of the observation car the whole level, and as soon as they reach the engine, the hobo's fire would appear to spell the end of things for you. You'd miss out on some coins and some toy parts and some of the best slapstick comedy I've ever seen, but not much else. Maybe you do get a game over if they get too far away, or it's different if you manage to catch up to them, but I'm sure as shit not playing this game again to check. That said, I do genuinely like this level, it's fun, and it's so nice to focus on one thing for more than a second. Plus, it just looks good. It's not just obstacles looming out of a snowstorm. The developers put in the extra effort to decorate the environment to either side of the train and to give context to the things flying at your face. You even leave footprints in the snow. The obstacles might not be randomised, but there is enough variety that it never becomes boring, and I think the complexity of the obstacles included only increases the further up the train you go, like there are invisible triggers that load in new areas for the train when you pass them. I'm not surprised at all Naughty Dog stole the set piece for Uncharted 2. Regardless of your efforts, you end up at the hobo's fire on top of the train. Hello? Is there someone there? Uh, I think we might need to get this kid to a hospital. He seems a little concussed. I can't imagine why. What follows is another minute and 20 seconds of uninterrupted film footage of Chris's first meeting with the hobo, which makes it infinitely better than its Tantalus counterpart. The only editing done by Blue Tongue to this scene is the addition of a musical sting at the end to more smoothly use the moment as a point of transition, but it's still really clunky. In fact, I am the king of the North! When we fade back in the, what? Who are you? You're not the hobo. What have you done with my boy? The interesting thing about this costume switch is that in that behind the scenes footage I showed a little bit of way back at the start of this video, there's a clip of Tom Hanks trying on almost this exact outfit, so I think this might have been the hobo's look until late into production. Which makes sense given he looks the crunchiest out of all the characters and that is saying a lot. I can't explain the change in characterization though. Or the Boston accent, that's all Jim. But I'm impressed that you managed to get this far. You're a regular hero, trying to give that girl her ticket back. But let me tell you, if you thought getting up here was hot, then you better prepare yourself for a shock. No, this is all wrong. I don't feel like this guy's going to shank me in the kidney for my coat the second I turn my back to him. It's just not the same, the vibe's not there. So it's hopeless then? God, did I record that line? Why don't you lean a little closer to the microphone, kid? I don't think it peaked enough. You're not going to do another take? Oh, okay. There's no way you're going to make it if you stay on the roof. There's one way to get that ticket back to the girl. Do you want to hear it? We gotta jump off this here train and take a shortcut. What? I guess he's not wrong. Now look me in the eye. Do you believe that you can do this? Oh no kid, get the fuck away from him, that's Scrooge McPuppet in disguise. He killed the hobo and took his place, run! One, two, three! 
And here we are. Oh, you thought the ticket's magical journey down the mountain from the movie had been cut out of the game? Guess again. Not only is it still here, Chris and the hobo are along for the ride, and it is fucking bonkers. You cannot slow down during this sequence. You can only go faster, and that makes dodging obstacles with the hobo's extremely wide turning circle an absolute nightmare. Not that you'll really need to dodge. Sometimes if you run into something you'll faceplant into the snow, but just as often the game will move you around it anyway. It's such a coin toss. Even if you get caught on something, you can't stop to rest or turn around. The mountain demands that you go down, so down is where you go. But the best part is, if you do actually hit something hard enough to knock the hobo over, that doesn't mean you'll stop sliding down the mountain. The hobo will just keep going, with Chris clinging to his back like the guy's a fucking toboggan. We got no time to waste. It's only if you hit something at the right angle that you'll actually come to a stop, and even then you'll still keep moving a little bit. The only way to get the hobo to stand up is to prompt him with a button press, but why would you when this is so much better? Look at him go! Aside from swoosing left and right, you can also jump, which usually only ends in disaster. It's a real shame you can't beat the level lying face down in the snow. You actually need to build up some speed to beat the Polar Express to the bottom of the mountain. It doesn't fuck about, and you can see how far away it is from you with these bars in the bottom right of the screen. I like how it's two bars now instead of one bar from the last level. What an unnecessary change. I probably failed this mission more than any other in the game because I was having too much fun just hurling the hobo at every wall to see what would happen, because there are some surfaces the game does not want you to touch under any circumstances. And as usual, the voice lines only make it better. Hang on, John! But even aside from me trying to make my own fun, I really enjoyed this level. It's not good. I feel like Sonic the Hedgehog at his absolute worst would run rings around it, but it's undeniably entertaining, and it looks great, just like the previous mission. I especially like how you can see the train going over bridges as you pass under them. It makes it feel like a genuine race. The camera cutting at random points in the level was very disorienting though. And then at the end you just ski right off the edge of a fucking cliff. Incredible. What follows is another movie clip that at first glance seems pretty accurate of Chris and the hobo skiing down the roof of the Polar Express, but then you notice the sound mix is weirdly quiet, and then it starts cutting super quick between shots. There's only one trick to this kid! And then this happens. <laughs> now. First of all, why cut the fact that the hobo turns into snow so Chris has to make the jump himself, but more importantly, what the fuck was that sound effect? That was so crunchy. Did the hobo just smash his head open on the side of the tender, or get it taken clean off by the ceiling of Flat Top Tunnel? They make the jump together in this version, and as we see in the next cutscene, Chris is fine, but the hobo never makes another appearance in the Blue Tongue game, so I think he might be straight up dead. I think we just heard a man die. He never reappears in the GBA title either. I think he might have died when they jumped into the tender there as well. I'm not really sure where to go from here. At last we finally find out what the conductor did with Holly. There are no free rides on the Polar Express. You board with a ticket, or you pay for your passage with physical labour. What's that sound coming from the engine? It's... Get back! It's sounding like something's gonna blow! This is terrible! Where are the engineers? So enter Smokey and Steamer, the engineers. Which is which, you ask? Fuck you. Like so many of the film's most cursed properties, they were not present in the book, but the game somehow makes them even worse by having them speak in rhyme. Kick sparks as they blow, watch out for the coal, once you put on those gloves, then we're ready to roll. 
why. I will admit though that their more cartoony stylized designs make them less of a trip into the uncanny valley than pretty much every other character in the film. They've got a very exaggerated theatrical way of moving that lends itself well to this early era of motion capture and that's mostly thanks to their performance artist, the late Michael Jeter, who passed away during production and to whom the film is dedicated. You know that name sounds kind of familiar, I wonder what else he was in. <laughs> We're coming up on the best scene in the film where the Polar Express drifts across a frozen lake and the conductor rips a fat dab, and I am so excited to see how this game decides to adapt it. But first, we've got to get through another minigame. All you need to do is grab the right parts as they come shooting out of the firebox and toss them to the right engineer. It's a return to the dead simple garbage of the Great Puppet War, and the only part that's even slightly challenging is staying awake long enough to pick up the toy part that comes flying at you. It does throw you a slight curveball by sending out the same parts over and over again, but you always know which ones you're missing thanks to the bizarre clip art pipes on each side of the screen. And anyway, it's funny when you give Ornsteamer and Smokey a wrong bit of machinery because they throw it aside with such disdain. It's great. It will wear out its welcome though. After a certain point you'll only have one or two parts left to grab, and waiting for them to cycle around again is absolute torture. You know, if parts are just spilling out of the firebox like that I feel as though the Polar Express has a few more problems than the engineers are letting on. What follows might be the most mangled movie clip in the entire game. To start with, the caribou are now here, which was not established at all in the previous minigame. Then it cuts from the conductor looking out the side of the cab to a caribou, and then suddenly everyone is out on the mainframe tugging on the engineer's beard to get them to move. There's no minigame here, the conductor just does it. The caribou move like they do in the movie, and then the clip ends and everyone's back in the cab. Why was this scene here? It contributed literally nothing to the game. It matters little enough in the movie as it is. All it really does is get the conductor up to the engine for the big set piece on the frozen lake, but here you could just have him arrive in a cutscene. It's not even cut like a lead into a mini game. It's just dropped in straight from the movie after it cuts to the front of the train. At least no one fucking died this time. Anyway, in the next cutscene, the conductor manipulates Chris into shoveling coal for free. Young man, you seem to have some skill at resolving these situations. Do you believe you have what it takes to get this train going again? I'm gonna do it. Let's get this train moving. You've got to get the train up to speed again, and the way to do it is with the most basic rhythm game I think I've ever played, set to music that I can only describe as, uh, not music. Dig shovel! Dig shovel! Dig shovel! Dig shovel! It's shit. You missed the mark on this one, Steven. As usual, the visuals are the best part about it. The poses Chris and the engineers strike on the beat are perfect, and I love the little extra detail of the background moving outside the cab to indicate the train is running back up to speed. It's just the gameplay is so boring. You're never asked to press more than four keys in a row, and it's only ever up, down, left, right, shift, or control. The beat is such that you'll never be challenged. Like every gimmick in the Polar Express, it feels like a tutorial for a mechanic that doesn't exist and is never coming back. Except in this case, it actually does, but has the exact same fucking thing. This isn't going to suddenly turn into Dance Dance Revolution Christmas Edition, it's just another three minutes that you're never getting back. Sly Raccoon had a more engaging rhythm game than this. This is easy! You said it, kid. Wait, what? Anyway, it's finally here. The scene we've all been waiting for. The best part of the movie. Let's go. It's not in the game. Fuck off. What do you mean it's not in the game? Instead, the conductor says Holly can't ride without a ticket. Young lady, there's still one matter outstanding, as you have failed to produce a valid ticket. Railway regulations specify that you must leave the train. So I guess that little shit was right about him going to throw her off the train in this version. He just wanted to get some free labour out of her before tossing her under the wheels. But then Chris just gives him Holly's ticket and they leave. No. Game, no. You had enough time to program the Great Puppet War and all these one-off minigames, but not two minutes of level where you guide the train over the lake? This is bullshit. You've ruined Christmas.
Surely the GBA game can't betray me like that. Surely the scene has to be in here. When we last left the Tantalus title, we had just arrived at the engine, and we get a short slideshow of Chris meeting up with Holly, and then the engineers, and it looks like something's about to go wrong, but then it's immediately resolved before the cutscene ends, and that's it, there's no conflict to episode 4. The engineers still speak in rhyme for some reason too, I don't get it. They didn't in the film. Was it something that got cut? Yes, as it turns out. The engineers originally had a song, which you can now only see in this fucking nightmare of an animatic that looks like it belongs in some analog horror web series. I didn't think the Polar Express could get any more Uncanny Valley than it already is, but god damn did it just prove me wrong. This guy's playing his beard like a banjo, and now it's trying to escape. They restarted the engine fire with a fart. I really don't understand why they cut this scene. Can I stop making this video now please? What's more pertinent to the conversation than the eldritch horrors burning into your retinas right now is that the dialogue prior to this cut song is spoken verbatim in this scene from the GBA game. What you done do, Dirt Train? I just turned those things like you told me to. Together. Huh? Together. together. You have to turn them together. together. But even more important is that after the cut song, the scene continues and the engineers explain through rhyme and shadow puppets how the hobo came to haunt the Polar Express. What the fuck? Why would you cut that? The hobo is never explained in the final film. He's just there. Why would you do this? Really? You cut that for pacing but left this shit in? Anyway, now you get to drive the train, which is fucking amazing. Hell yeah, this is the good shit right here. These levels were my favourite part of the GBA title. Not just because they come with 90 candy canes a pop, thank God, but because the focus is entirely on the train. It's pretty simple to start off with in this level, but the thing about Tantalus is, as I've already mentioned, they actually understand the concept of a difficulty curve. So while episode 4 only features two tracks to switch between at any point, later missions up the number to three or even four. It's not just introduced and immediately discarded, the shifting gameplay is almost as core to the experience as the 2D platforming sections, though sadly never last as long. I really like the look of it too. The model of the train is great and the twists and turns it takes do add a lot to the experience. Sure, the backgrounds aren't anywhere near as detailed as the ones from the Blue Tongue game, but that doesn't matter because they still look fine for a licensed handheld game and you actually get to drive the fucking train. The only annoying thing about it is, if you miss a string of candy canes, you can't go back to collect them. You have to restart the entire level to grab them. So naturally I always only ever missed the last five of the level. It's over way too soon though. Finish episode 4's one level and then it's back to 2D platforming in episode 5. But before we even get to that, there's another long slideshow where the engineers see something on the tracks so the kids stop the train. And in this version it doesn't even explicitly summon the conductor. He's just present in the next part of the cutscene and the train is moving again without ever having to remove the caribou from the tracks. So I've got to ask, why include it? Then he says, all ahead, slow, like in the movie. But then the train is instantly traveling at top speed and everything is breaking apart and now we've got to find a cotter pin, this thing from the movie. Well, it's nothing if not an attempted adaptation. In actual gameplay though, it's still the same old collect free bells and find the exit tedium from the first few episodes of the game. Only this time it's set in an industrial nightmare train engine filled with furnaces, fan exhausts and flaming coal. It's Definitely a spectacle. The Polar Express has never looked this big or this hellish. I especially enjoyed platforming past the front of the train, but mechanically it's just more of the same. And it goes on like this for free whole levels. You don't even get any new power-ups. The only real additions to the mechanics are these piles of coal which will collapse if you stand on them, and switches that open doors on a countdown timer that you have to race to jump through before they close. It's more challenging, sure, but not in a fun way. The candy canes are spread out over much more distance and in far more obtuse places too. It's super easy to miss one even if you're going over the level with a fine-toothed comb, especially if it's out of sight behind a movable 
purple box that you don't notice right at the start of the level. Even if you do notice them all, it's very easy to lose health trying to collect them, because Chris's hitbox is fucking massive. It wasn't a problem so much earlier in the game, but as the levels grow denser with obstacles it becomes harder and harder to get around. And I know that's the point, but there were so many moments where Chris didn't even hit an obstacle and I still took damage. Just as well you have four hit points rather than three. Naturally you don't even find the cotter pin at the end of episode five, but in a nice touch of continuity, episode six does start out with Chris at the front of the engine, which doesn't seem like something worthy of praise, I know. But after the insanity of the Blue Tongue game just having the protagonist teleport around to the Polar Express at random, I'll settle for even the most basic object permanence. The conductor and Holly are here too now, but whatever, it's fine. The train is coming up to Glacier Gulch, so you know what that means. It's time for the best scene in the movie, and unlike some games I could mention, the GBA title does not disappoint. Sure, it's not the super fast roller coaster ride that it is in the movie. Even if you hit an obstacle, the train just derails and comes to a stop in the snow. And it doesn't end with the Polar Express drifting over a frozen lake, but it's better than literally fucking nothing. It gives you an extra set of tracks to switch between two, and following the trail of candy canes does actually requires some quick reflexes. I had to replay the level multiple times to collect them all because my brain just couldn't get the rhythm right and I don't even know why. Overall, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't disappointed by the absence of the frozen lake in both games. It seems like the most obvious and easy moment to adapt from the film. The GBA game tried, sure, but it only really adapted the first half of the scene, though this is at least more than the Blue Tongue title did. But more than anything, now I'm salty because we have to go back through Puppet Town, and I didn't even get to bust out the Deja Vu sound clip. Oh, what the hell, it's close enough. Deja Vu, I've just been to this place before. Episode 7 begins with the train repaired and the conductor full on ready to put Holly to work shoveling coal to earn her passage before Chris reveals he has her ticket. Fucking hell dude, I was just making a joke earlier in the video. I didn't think that was actually canon. I thought this story was set in 1950s Michigan, not 2020s Arkansas. Anyway, now we're in Nightmare Puppet Land and it's only marginally less disturbing than it is in the actual film. Wait, is that Pinocchio? Huh. If I had a dollar for every movie directed by Robert Zemeckis starring Tom Hanks, disturbing CGI, and Pinocchio, I'd have two dollars. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. Puts a whole new spin on the conductor saying the boss wants the old toys rounded up and recycled. I fucking dare them to do a live action remake of the Polar Express. Come to think of it, Zemeckis ended up making a Christmas Carol movie as well, with a Scrooge that looks super similar to the puppet here. What is going on? Is is there a Beowulf puppet hidden somewhere in this scene too? Anyway, episode 7 is just more of the same, only this time it's set inside a nightmare factory of junk piles and hanging toys. It's a pretty cool environment and the game takes the opportunity to shake up the level design with more side areas and dead ends, like you've stumbled right off the Polar Express and into Boo's mansion, but the underlying gameplay loop remains unchanged. There is one significant difference though. It seems the Great Puppet War has spread from PCs and home consoles onto the shores of handheld gaming because the toys are out in force. For the first time in the game we have actual enemies to fight rather than obstacles to avoid and you can actually find power-ups to help you take them down. Some toy boxes contain paddleball rackets that you can use to bounce these robot fuckers off their feet. They don't even get back up either unless you reset the area by walking through a door. I think you're straight up killing them. There are these tiny remote control cars zooming around the place as well, but Chris is incapable of aiming low enough to hit them with the paddle ball. All you can do is try to avoid them, and good luck. Episode 7 introduces another power-up, the balloon. It can carry you up to platforms too high to normally reach, but that's about it. If you so much as look at another surface, it'll pop and send you plummeting back down to earth, although thankfully there's no fall damage to deal with if that does happen. Interesting as the new additions to the gameplay are, they're not enough to keep it fresh across the three levels episode 7 consists of. It's not like there's a confrontation with Scrooge McPuppet or anything close to a boss fight here. You still just need to collect free bells to unlock the exit. You still have to deal with a hitbox the size of the North Pole. You still have 30 candy canes. 
contains to find. We're still not even halfway done with all the collectibles by the end of episode 7, but you know what, I think this number might be better anyway. Back in the Blue Tongue game, I'm still seething about the lack of a frozen lake. Look, even the conductor seems confused, like, shouldn't we be back at the engine doing shit? Chris and Holly linger of course, but it doesn't matter anyway because the puppets are already busy invading the rest of the train. He already knows the stakes. I should warn you though, there are some nasty toys on this train. I've got a sneaking suspicion that there may be trouble ahead. I love how the conductor is just standing outside the door at the end of the car too. I see you there. Now you're probably thinking that the return journey down the train might just be a rehash of the Great Puppet War from the start of the game in reverse. And it is. But don't worry, because Blue Tongue decided to switch it up by turning the entire thing into one extended death march of an escort mission. Chris and Holly are trapped behind enemy lines, and the only way to get them out of the Great Puppet War is to guide her back into friendly territory. And it's it's not as bad as it could have been, honestly. The game remains a chore to play, but it's not any better or worse than it was at the start. It is, however, very repetitive. First off, it's a rematch against these jack-in-the-boxes. The throwing mechanic hasn't changed at all. It's still brain-dead simple. The only challenge to be found is getting close enough for the auto-aim to kick in and actually point your projectile in the right direction. I did discover Chris can levitate, though. That was fun, for like a second, I guess. Everyone's so busy asking Chris if he believes he can do simple things like pull a brake cord or ski down a mountain, when his faith in himself has already clearly evolved beyond our mortal understanding. Maybe Santa should be believing in him. Back in the ice car, things are still pretty chill, but the puppets have made the fatal strategic error of leaving their supplies for the taking. They even made the mistake of leaving these ice boots behind. Hey, why didn't I get that the first time? I'll shut the fuck up. Okay, game, let me let you in on a little writing secret. A sneaky little writing tip from your old pal Monotom. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Don't try to excuse your own shitty writing by having the characters acknowledge that it's shit. Either go back and fix the problem, or don't bring it up at all. Just own it. What are you doing here? bad. Anyway, instead of a game of asteroid, this time the ice car is filled with boxes that you have to drag around to create a path for Holly to slip slide down. Like all children, she's only capable of moving in straight lines until she's interrupted by some sort of obstacle, which does make things easy when there's a lot of open space between her and the next step of the path, but when it gets cramped around the middle of the car, it becomes an exercise in tedium. And the worst part is, she'll just stand there watching you, the entire time. Ugh. There's a rematch against the mice that's meant to be harder, I guess, because they give you two minutes instead of one, and a few more vermin to throw, but it's still exactly the same as before. Perhaps even easier, because for me, half of them bunched up in the same corner and let me bully them back into the basket. At least the animations are still fun. Ooh, a toy part. <coughs> The cook is gone from the kitchen car, but maybe he knows something we don't. The Great Puppet War is entering its final stages, but Scrooge still has one last trick up his sleeve. What's that noise? I don't know, but it sounds pretty angry. What can it be? I think it's that nasty <laughs> toy who stole our tickets. It wants to stop us from getting to the North Pole. Well, I'm not gonna let a toy stop me from eating Santa Claus. How about you? No way. We've come so far. It's time to put this toy away for good. In the next car we find the kids locked in battle with Scrooge, and he's changed a little since we last saw him. Anyway, you throw snowballs at him until he dies. Be careful! And me! Shut the fuck up, you little shit! Who are you anyway? Oh, don't you fucking start with me, kiddo. This fight is bonkers on so many levels. Putting aside that Scrooge has turned into a fucking kaiju between appearances, this, once again, inexplicably pre-rendered cutscene, is the first and only time him and Chris have anything close to an actual conversation. So you want to go to the North Pole? You're just a bitter old toy. Christmas isn't about toys. It's about giving and sharing. Ah, there's no Christmas without toys. Christmas cannot happen without me. Let's see about that. Watch out! 
And of course it's about whether the spirit of Christmas is consumerism or community. And who fucking cares? How is this even about Chris's existential crisis? The spectacle of all the kids pelting snowballs at Scroogezilla is fucking wild too. Why is there an actual battle set piece boss fight in the Polar Express video game? This does not belong here. There are actual mechanics to the fight as well. You have to jump over his fists to avoid taking damage as that little shit never ceases to remind you about. And you have to expose his giant golden heart with an extra snowball to the face in order to actually hurt him. You have to keep running back to the trenches to grab extra snowballs but otherwise it's not a terrible fight. And then, like everything in the game, before you're brain even has time to process what's happening in front of you, it's over. Scrooge is fucking dead, for good this time, and with him goes the Great Puppet War. These kids just killed a living thinking being, and they're going to have to live with that for the rest of their lives. Who's up for some hot chocolate? I'm not kidding. The game goes from giant Scrooge boss battle to hot chocolate. Just watch the cutscene. Yay! Would you children care to join us in the dining car? It's time we had some refreshments. What? Attention please. Would there be any Polar Express passengers requiring refreshment? Pacing? What's that? What? Did no one playtest this garbage? What are these transitions? There's a little dialogue from the film here, but everything quickly goes off the rails when the conductor reveals they're short-staffed. And oh, Chris, you're here. Why don't you do all this extra work for free? I'm gonna need your assistance, young man. As you can see, we have a lot of thirsty passengers, but we're short one waiter. I need you to help out and make sure that everyone gets a cup of hot chocolate. Do you think you can do that? Uh, I think so. I've never done it before. Trust me, I think you'll be a natural. Man, you're a real piece of shit, James. No, not you, Jim Hanks. I'm sure you're fine. I'm talking about the conductor. Yes, that's his actual name, at least according to TV tropes. I'm not sure where that particular editor got the name from. I couldn't find any evidence of it elsewhere like I could for Hero Boy's name being Chris in behind the scenes interviews or Hero Girl's name being Holly in the official art book. Maybe it's said in a commentary track I couldn't find. I don't know. The Polar Express fan wiki actually lists lists the conductor's name as Woodford Newton, and cites this piece of journalistic diarrhea about a potential prequel from November of this year as the source. The AI-generated poster is bad enough, but it's hardly the only thing in the article that's just been made the fuck up, so I'm going to guess this is bullshit. Speaking of the fan wiki getting things wrong, it also states the hobo is the film's main antagonist, and… no? Aside from when he puppeteers Scrooge for about five seconds, he does nothing but help Chris out. This section of the video ranting about the fan wiki used to be even longer, but it's only five minutes to midnight, so we'd better move on. You're welcome. Anyway, it's another rhythm game. Only instead of shoveling coal into the engine's firebox, you're pouring hot chocolate down everyone's throat. That this sequence is another rhythm game is what made me dig a little deeper into if the engineers used to have a song of their own, since why else would they reuse the gimmick here. It's still just as brain dead simple as the first go around and that might be why I kept fucking it up. It's really worth it too because the looks the waiters give you when you miss a button are priceless. They couldn't get the rights to the hot chocolate song from the film and that's probably for the best because the beat in that thing is way too fast for this video game. But instead the scene has another track of what I can only describe as anti-music. Which is so weird because the soundtrack otherwise has been really good. I guess Steven was having another off day when he wrote this one. Which sucks because this minigame goes on for fucking ever. You have to serve hot chocolate and cakes to four tables. That's 16 bars you have to actually push buttons on and 32 in total because you have to listen to the waiter do it too. Why do they walk like that? 
I kind of can't believe this sequence is here. Not that it's in the game at all, but that it's here, specifically. The scene in the movie serves no narrative function other than to have Holly lose her ticket. The waiters and chefs who all have the same expressionless face for some reason barely hang around long enough for the kids to take more than a sip. If the sequence was in the same place here, so much of the game's early insanity would be mitigated. You wouldn't have to have Scrooge McPuppet hide Holly's ticket in a vent. You could just have Chris find it on her seat and move on from there. But no, they couldn't cut a second of the Great Puppet War, so the hot chocolate had to go here, after the game's final boss. Oh yeah, Scrooge was the final boss by the way. There's still at least an hour of game left, fuck me. You know, every time I make one of these big critiques, I start to dream about the things I'm covering. It happened with Jurassic Park, it happened with Men in Black, it happened with The Lost World, it's happened with Tomb Raider even though that video isn't out at the time of uploading. I'm so deep in the Polar Express right now, I am terrified of going to sleep in case I wake up here with the conductor chanting that we never ever let it cool as boiling hot chocolate is poured into my eyes. Anyway, you ever notice how in the movie Holly hides two cups of hot chocolate? One on her seat and one on the floor? and then after the song one of them is just gone? She never loses her ticket either. It's just there on her seat after the song. I've watched this film too many times for this video. The funny thing is, her sneaking away two cups actually makes sense in this version, because not only does she save one for Billy, she would save one for Chris, who as we know has been manipulated into providing free labour by this shithead of a conductor. Yeah, they still take one to Billy, it's just lost all the purpose it had in the film. Cool. Great. Thanks. Now this could still technically work as a transition to another rhythm game inspired by the song sung at the back of the observation car from the movie. Maybe instead of hitting the buttons on the beat, you get them wrong intentionally to match Billy singing. I mean, I wouldn't be happy about another rhythm game here, but it would at least make sense, right? Fuck you, North Pole. I swear, I didn't edit that. Okay, I cut out this save successful card, but otherwise I haven't touched it. The cutscene ends, and then bang, smash cut to the North Pole. We didn't even arrive in this version, we're just here. You can try to hide how awkward an edit it is with the main menu music, but it's an impossible task. It's such a jarring cut, even the conductor agrees. Exactly. And after the most disgusting edit ever made, the game just plays uninterrupted footage from the film for a full minute. They don't even cut out the shot of this little shit noticing Chris and Holly leave the group, even though they could and his appearance later on in Santa's bulging sack would make just as much sense. They cut pretty much the entire scene where Chris and Holly try to bully Billy into meeting Santa with them too. And then the cinematic just gets weird. Something I've noticed about a lot of the film clips included in the Blue Tongue game is that they have dialogue and sometimes sound effects, but never any music. Again, probably because they didn't shell out for the rights to the movie's soundtrack. I think this might have been what killed the hobo, and it also means at the end of this clip Chris and Holly have no reaction whatsoever to the observation car rolling away from the rest of the train because the developers replaced the film audio with their own sound mix and didn't bother to have either of them utter so much as an oh no. And then it immediately fades to this. What are we going to do? Why did you record that line in an empty swimming pool? Also hang on, Blue Tongue, so you could have done a level set on Glacier Gulch and the Frozen Lake, you had the technology, you just chose not to. Fuck you, honestly, you've ruined Christmas again. This is another level I don't hate, mostly because it's just those parts of the GBA title where you control the train, only with a little more complexity and a lot more detail. Aside from the familiar track switching, you have the option of speeding up or slowing down in order to avoid obstacles like potholes, other stopped rolling stock, and these disgusting elf tractor things. But come on, we're not slowing down. It's only five minutes to midnight, we've got to get those kids to Santa so he can kill them. You can lean from side to side too, because apparently there's a wheel inside the observation car that allows you to do that. I bet you could use that wheel to steer the train car. You can actually spend the whole level grinding to one side of the track or another, but I wouldn't recommend it because it sounds as bad as it looks. Where are we going? After a while, the only reason I leaned left or right was to swat the tractor things off the road, and with the right amount of speed, you can send them flying. 
The rolling stock don't go as far and neither does the observation car if you actually manage to derail it, which is disappointing. The level does feature some areas with a bunch of separate tracks to go down, but they're only worth exploring if you want the toy parts, and Holly always tells you which way to go if you actually do, so it's not even worth replaying to search the thing out. It is also disappointingly slow. There are some parts on these super steep slopes where the observation car goes flying down the hill, sometimes literally, but for the most part, it's just a leisurely cruise. I didn't realise I was riding the Sydney light rail, although given the absolute fucking state of the North Pole's rail infrastructure, it would not surprise me at all to learn this place was managed by Transport New South Wales. There we go, that's a universal joke everyone will understand. At least the level environment looks decent. Decent. Blue Tongue is nothing if not consistent in the game's presentation, but the hill just goes on for so long. I didn't mind it with the ski down the mountain because we see slopes like that in the movie, and we are meant to be racing a train. There needs to be a lot of slope for the Polar Express to zigzag its way down, but here, the North Pole is just mostly empty industrial streets built onto a hill that goes on forever. In fact, it gets even steeper the further down you go. What little we see of the North Pole in the film also has this kind of endless hill design, but the scene this level is adapting goes on for less than a minute, not for over six. It doesn't give you time to notice how fucking long the hill is, and furthermore the line the observation car ends up on isn't just a straight line down the side of the hill like it is in the game, it's a spiral that runs rings through the North Pole so the distance appears to be greater than it actually is. Side note, but I really don't like this design in general. I understand Chris Van Allsburg, pictured here as the 11th Doctor, couldn't reconcile the idea of Santa and his four elf friends making millions of presents in a tiny house each year. In a story about a magic train that rides halfway up the Northern Hemisphere in five minutes, that was apparently too much for his suspension of disbelief. You know, all the depictions I'd seen of it before, were little chalets, you know, and he's got maybe two dozen elves, and, and clearly that's not equal to the task. Some things, you know, you take on faith, that's belief. But I wasn't taking on belief the fact that you could make that many toys in one little Swiss chalet. But the result just looks so disgusting, even in the book. That's right, I said it. The North Pole of the film still feels like a manifestation of the back rooms, but it also seems quite compact. The North Pole of the Blue Tongue game feels massive and sprawling, and even though we actually see elves and these weird tractor things around the place, it still feels so much emptier because the hill goes on for six fucking minutes. It's so big it has its own drawbridge. Um, I'm not an engineer, but that bridge is not closing with arms that short. Wait. Is this? Aurora Borealis. This is how the level ends, by the way. We seem to be going underground. Hold on tight, everyone. I think we've arrived. Where have we arrived? We've reached the end of the track. <laughs> Back with Tantalus on the Game Boy Advance, things stick a little closer to the film. There's still no song at the back of the observation car, but the Polar Express is at least shown arriving at the North Pole. It even adapts the plot point about Santa Claus choosing a certain kid to give the first gift of Christmas to. Yeah, the Blue Tongue game just completely fucking ignored that. It's gone. We then flash ahead to after everyone has left the train, with Holly asking the conductor about Billy staying behind. And true to his character, the conductor couldn't give less of a shit if he tried. No one is required to see Santa. They still go to get Billy. We still get a shot of that little shit noticing them leave. Chris still accidentally uncouples the observation car from the rest of the train, but it doesn't just immediately cut to everything going wrong. This time around, we do actually get a bit of the conversation where Chris and Holly try to bully Billy into coming to see Santa before the observation car starts to roll back down the hill. And they even react. Congratulations, Tantalus. You did the bare fucking minimum. <laughs> The level that follows is pretty much the same one from the Blue Tongue game, only shorter and handheld and filled with candy canes. It's basically the same as all the other levels where you control the train in this game, only now you're the observation car and you're rolling through the North Pole. The change in scenery is nice, but the gimmick has definitely worn out its welcome by now, especially when I've had to do all of them at least twice to get all the fucking candy canes. Episode 9 begins with Chris pulling the brake to stop the observation car, and I do like the little detail of 
of him trying the emergency cord first. The observation car comes to a stop, and as in the film, they all climb out into the North Pole, following the sound of a distant sleigh bell. Or at least Holly and Billy are. Chris can't actually hear it. Yeah, that's right, we're actually doing this plot point. Unfortunately, that means three whole levels of wandering the empty streets of the North Pole, and... Uh... The thing I've discovered about the Polar Express is that as a piece of fiction, it's only tolerable when they're on the train. Whenever they're off the train, everybody should be asking, where's the train? Because without it, the Polar Express fucking sucks. Half the movie is set in the North Pole, but every time I think back on the film, it only feels like 15 minutes right at the end. And whenever I watch the bloody thing, it feels like three fucking hours. At least the train is moving. At least you can have fun set pieces like the Frozen Lake. There's so much you can do with it. And then you get to the North Pole, and it's just an empty void of old industrial buildings. Stark, barren, devoid of life. The second half of the Polar Express is such a slog, and I guess that means the video games are perfect adaptations in that regard, because episode 9 of the GBA title is so fucking boring. And that's not to say it's bad. I like the change in scenery. I actually think Tantalus's North Pole feels cozier and more lived in than the movies. I really like the detail of how you start off beside the observation car. It has fun with puzzles and level design, like 9-2 where each of the three bells is in its own challenge room and the exit is in a fourth. Or this bit in 9-1 where you have to put actual thought into getting this box off this ledge. Or this platforming gauntlet in 9-3 where you have to avoid moving obstacles while jumping from conveyor belt to conveyor belt. But that's three minor things across a trio of levels that took over 20 minutes to to complete, and your objective is still to just find free bells and then the exit. It's so fucking frustrating because Tantalus's crack at adapting the Polar Express isn't bad. If it weren't so repetitive, I think you could actually get away with calling it good. But that's the thing. It only took me 2 hours and 45 minutes to beat, but it felt so much longer than that, and the absurd amount of collectibles did not help. As bad and as bonkers as the Blue Tongue game gets, it definitely holds your attention. Attention. By the time I reached episode 10 of the GBA title, I was more than ready to fall asleep. At least we're out of the snow. How we've found our way into the present factory is never explained, but we're here now, so let's just go with it. You get the sense the developers wanted to be done with the game too, because the cutscene is brief, and all the elves have the exact same portrait. The only way to tell them apart is by what hats they're wearing. Pretty much all the elf stuff is cut out, but you know what? Who cares? Everyone ends up jumping aboard the pneumatic, and thank fuck it's another vehicle level. Unfortunately, it's also the worst of the lot. The pneumatic canister is much smaller than the Polar Express, or even the observation car. Most of the time it sits partially obscured by the heads-up display at the very bottom of the screen, and furthermore, it's hidden within the tube it's travelling through. It's not impossible to see, especially on my definitely real Game Boy Advance that comes with a 32-inch screen. Ahem. <laughs> but on an actual handheld, I could imagine this being absolute hell to look at, especially on a sunny day. At least the background is pretty bare, but it's also pretty boring. It's mostly just an empty void with a few tubes trailing off into the distance. It does move whenever the tube you're in curves, but never very much, so it feels less like the roller coaster ride the film was aiming for, and more like the observation car level from the Blue Tongue game. It's not even all that complex either. You're only ever presented with one or two tubes to switch between and the trail of candy canes is much easier to follow because the path is barely more than a rigid straight line. I actually managed to get all 90 canes on my first go around, and I was so bored I never even went back to see what might happen if you take a wrong turn and end up flying off into the void. Man, Osha's gonna have a fucking field day with the North Pole if any of the elves ever blow the whistle on Santa. The health and safety violations continue into episode 11, which, after another very brief slideshow of the kids following the sound of the bell into Santa's nightmare factory, is another three levels of 2D platforming, and it went on for 40 minutes. 
The change in scenery cannot save what is still just the same fucking thing from the start of the game. Sure, it's reached the apex of its difficulty curve, but not in any way that's fun. It just means the levels are so much bigger, and the collectibles are spread out over so much more distance, and every step you take is already occupied by some kind of obstacle, like these ribbon cutting scissors installed in every ceiling for some reason. Like in episode 9, there are still moments where the level design has a little fun, such as this bit where you have to push this box down multiple levels to hit a switch, but most of the time it just means you have to grab a bell placed directly beside a steam vent. It also introduces the game's final enemy type, elves. I played this game back in May of 2023. It was only in November that I sat down to watch through the recordings to take notes, and by that point I had mostly forgotten everything about the Tantalus game, but I had such a visceral reaction to the elves when I saw them again, and now I understand why. They are always in the way. Sure, their slow speed makes them easy enough to jump over, but that also makes them an absolute nightmare to deal with when they're camping an area you need to get through, like when they just hang out at the top of a ladder or beside a candy cane. Episode 11 is not the mechanical climax the game has been building to since its very first moments. It is a nadir we have been steadily sinking toward with each and every 2D platforming section. At least 11 3 has a bit more verticality and isn't just another level set in a nightmare factory full of elves, but that does not mean it's fun to play. I was so bored and so frustrated that I actually started using save states to get through it because I had no patience left for this shit. You don't know how happy I was to discover this was the final set of 2D platforming levels in the game. Good fucking riddance. But that doesn't mean the game is over. Oh no. Episode 12 picks up where episode 11 ended with the kids finding their way to the conveyor belt maze. They find Billy's present, and like in the movie, all end up chasing it down the conveyor belts to this giant slippery dip. It's definitely cut down from the original scene, but it's actually pretty faithful. And best of all, it leads into a level that's actually pretty good. Sure, that's because Tantalus just outright stole the set piece from Super Mario 64, but if you're going to steal anyway, you might as well do it from someone who actually knows what they're doing. It's more or less another vehicle level, but instead of a train or rolling stock or a tube, you're still playing as Chris, and instead of having multiple tracks to switch between, you have a single wide path you have to slip back and forth across. It's actually pretty challenging too, because Chris moves like he's sliding down an icy slope. He picks up speed way faster than you might think, and the turns usually come too quickly to course correct dart in to grab some candy canes at the wrong moment, and Chris is going to go flying off the side of the track, and you know what? It's fucking hilarious. <laughs> Santa's going to jail for criminal negligence. Aside from the controls, the only obstacle you'll face are these piles of garbage, but the track is so wide that they're easy enough to avoid. The track takes up so much of the screen that I don't even mind that the background is another low effort void with some distant catwalks. Although to be fair to the game, the same was true of this scene in the movie. And after all that, the level ends with Chris dropping off the end of the track into a bottomless pit anyway. He even seems happy about it. Yeah! Although that might just be because he's free from the worst friction burn ever. All that sliding must have ground his ass down to the bone. I'd be happy to fall off a cliff and die too. Speaking of wanting to fall off a cliff and die, when we last left the Blue Tongue game, the observation car was rolling into the darkness of a tunnel. <coughs> I know I keep saying this, but I swear, I did not edit that. The game goes from everyone screaming as they enter the tunnel, to the observation car already stopped at the turntable, and the kids just casually climbing onto the tracks. Chris never pulls the brake, the car never hits the buffers, the hobo never gets smashed into snow. We're just here now. And two cuts later we're in Santa's nightmare factory watching the elves leave for the square in the Numo. No leisurely stroll through the North Pole for us this time, no minigame where you have 
have to decide whether Steven Spielberg goes on the naughty list when the elves inevitably drag Chris into working for them. Blue Tongue clearly wants the game to be over as much as I do, although given the way this title has gone so far, I'm going to count that as a positive. The less of the North Pole there is, the fucking better. Also yeah, that's actually canonically Steven Spielberg in the movie. Robert Zemeckis put it in there as a joke. You know that name Steven Spielberg sounds kind of familiar, I wonder what he's done with his life- ah! At this point I might as well hide a dinosaur in the thumbnail and throw this video in the Jurassic Park playlist. Also for what it's worth, I could find no evidence that this kid is actually Steven Spielberg. It's listed on the IMDB trivia page for the Polar Express, which has been plagiarised almost word for word in behind the scenes articles like this one, but Robert Zemeckis has never said it anywhere. Way to ruin my joke, reality. I guess I won't be able to put this video in the Jurassic Park playlist. I'm not changing the thumbnail again though, the dinosaur stays. Anyway, welcome to the tube system. If you have a history of motion sickness, maybe just listen to this part of the video. The aim of the level is to hit the correct coloured switches as Holly calls them out, and you do it in first person from the driver's seat of the pneumatic car, right after they tease you with a third person view from behind the carriage. I sort of get why they settled on first person. The tube is so cramped and the car is so big that it would be near impossible to see the colour of the next switch, much less what angle it's positioned at on the wall, but the way it is here just makes me want to vomit. The controls are so sensitive, even just tapping the A or D key sends you spinning around the walls of the tube. Add to that the tiny hitboxes on all the switches and it's just an exercise in nausea. You're on a time limit too, something I didn't even realise until I watched the recording back to take notes because I was so focused on hitting all the switches without throwing up that I just never checked the corners of the screen. And the whole time you have to put up with Holly screaming at you about what switch to hit next, even if that colour is nowhere in sight. And this goes on for six rounds. Why? <laughs> At least the shots of the scenery outside the tube that you get between rounds is nice. The North Pole is still pretty barren, but I like the bridge and the nuclear power plant cooling towers belching radiation into the air that Santa has for some reason. Plus they don't make me want to hurl all over my keyboard. It does make it very obvious how each round is played on the same track though. Can't believe a tie-in game would cut corners like that. The level ends as unceremoniously as it began, with the Numo carrying the kids to the same exit they've already passed through six times already. And the next we see of them, the car has already stopped and everyone is already climbing out. The game is nothing if not consistent about that at least. Anyway, this film clip might be the least edited in the game. Sure, the original sound mix got thrown out the window and replaced with stock sound effects and the new score, but otherwise it's just a single panning shot of the kids climbing out of the Numo and looking over the wrapping paper room. And then this happens. Where did he go? I don't know, but he's following that present. What? No, game. You can't just cut out an entire scene and then act like it doesn't matter. Fuck off. You had a rough cut of the film, you could have mangled together a clip of the kids finding Billy's present in the conveyor belt room to explain how he got here. You can't just cut from this to this and pretend it makes sense. This story is already hard enough to fucking follow as it is, why are you trying to make it even harder? Anyway, this level's shit. I mean, obviously right, it's this game. But no, you don't understand. This is where Blue Tongue looked across the room at Tantalus and decided to copy their homework. Your trip through Santa's nightmare factory is a gauntlet of platforming puzzles, where you have to find and pull switches to open the way to the exit, all while fighting against the tide of the conveyor belts. And you just can't. If you miss a turn off or a platform, you can't jump back to catch them. The game will not allow it. The only way to reach them is to let the conveyor belt take you all the way around and try again. And because of the way each of these rooms is organised, you're going to have to go through the whole gauntlet multiple times anyway, even after you've already solved 
the puzzle and opened the way to the exit. Some switches are on their own side paths that aren't needed to reach the exit. Sometimes these meat grinders and big blowers aren't needed to leave the room either. And every time it happens, you have to go back and switch them off in order to reach the right path to continue. Even when you do open the way, the final switch is usually right next to the exit, but offers no way to actually reach it, so you have to cross the whole fucking gauntlet again to continue. The rage you feel watching Holly just ride her way out ahead of you is nothing short of blinding. At least it sounds like Chris gets hurt when he goes through a tunnel. Good. As is tradition by this point, the level doesn't really end. We just instantly cut to the next scene with no transition period. Chris goes into another tunnel, and now everyone's on the big slide down to Santa's pile of presents. The whole thing is cut down to less than 10 seconds. Why even bother to have these clips at all if you're not even going to use them as segues? Actually, I can answer that question. The developers clearly ran out of time and threw this hack job together in order to meet their Christmas deadline. But don't worry, because the game still somehow now has room to get worse. Oh, just look at it. The bouncing presents, the hanging ribbons, the jack-in-the-boxes. This is it, the absolute bottom of the creative barrel, and the game actually expects you to climb out of it. Also, where the fuck did you get that torch? I think we've all played stuff like this. Games that aren't challenging, they're just tedious, and that's what makes them difficult. That lack of engagement which sends your concentration wandering elsewhere in search of something more stimulating. That's when it gets you. That's when you make mistakes or take damage. Not that I can really blame the player here. It's not exactly a matter of skill. Chris's hitbox is enormous, which makes it easy for him to take damage. And every surface is so slippery, it's almost impossible to land a jump. Even launching Chris directly at a hanging ribbon will make the game pause before actually allowing you to grab it. And things only get worse once the platforms start moving. Whether they drop out from under you when Chris lands on them, or magically levitate up and down the pile of presents, escaping them is next to impossible because they either move too fast or too slow. Either you'll be trapped at the bottom of a pit trying to jump high enough to get the platform you're standing on to lift back up to a height you can actually leave it from, or you'll be left standing in place for minutes at a time waiting for the fucking stars to align and two boxes to come within jumping distance of each other. Having a double jump doesn't help because it never gives you the kind of height you need even if you do use it. Oh, and if you fall between the platforms to a lower level, have fun climbing climbing all the way back up to where you started. Jesus wept. The 2D platforming sections of the GBA game were exactly the same, but we built up to the tedium across the whole title there. Blue Tongue managed to find it in two levels right at the very end. It only took 10 minutes to play, but it felt like a thousand. The worst part is, it's not just a gauntlet straight up to the end of the level. There are side paths with coins and hearts and toy parts to go down, and I have never felt more frustrated to brute force my way past another section of bad platforming only to discover I had jumped my way to a dead end. The turnoffs aren't signposted at all either. You can think you're going the right way and then suddenly, oops, you've hit a brick wall. Get fucked. It's not even an interesting environment to play in. It's just a pile of presents. There's a lot of colour, sure, but it's just visual noise that's mostly hidden in the shadows anyway. It doesn't use certain colours to guide you the right way out. It doesn't use certain shapes to signpost how high up the pile you are. It doesn't even use light to tell you where to go. It's just Christmas vomit all over the screen. It's only when you get to the top and the pile of presents starts to taper off that it becomes any any sort of interesting, but you get to see that for like a second before the level fades out. Fucking hell that was torture. I've said this about the Blue Tongue game several times throughout the video, but it's true and it bears repeating. It is a bad game, yeah, but for most of the runtime, it's been bad in a fascinating kind of way, but not anymore. Just like the film once you get to the North Pole, this is just fucking bad. But at least we're almost finished. There's one more level and then we're done. There's just one last thing we have to do first. Alright, you've watched this far into the video, you know how I've structured it, let's just get it over with. What What's the pile of presents like in the GBA title? It's not in the game. Oh, thank fuck. Christmas is fucking saved. The closest we get is this very small pile in 11.3, but it's clearly not the same one, and it's in the wrong point in the story too. But you know what? I don't fucking care. Could you imagine another three levels of collecting bells in this fucking shit? 
I'm sure it was originally planned, but I'm not complaining that it's gone. I've never been happier to discover that a game was rushed out the door before it was done in my entire life. But you know what this means, don't you? We're all the way at the bottom. We're standing on the shore of Kokaitis watching Satan chow down on Judas, Brutus and Cassius in the middle of the lake. We actually made it all the way to treachery. All that's left is to climb up the devil's asshole, and we're finally free of this nine-tiered hell. So, naturally, it's at this point that both games turned around and stabbed me in the back. The final levels of both Blue Tongue's minigame Torture Wheel and Tantalus's tedious 2D platformer are effectively the same. In both games you guide the Zeppelin carrying Santa's huge sack through the North Pole to the Christmas tree at the centre of town. Only one's 2D and the other is 3D. You have to dodge obstacles, some moving, some not, you have to thread the needle through tight gaps and good fucking luck, and get this, you have to do it on a time limit or else Christmas is ruined forever. Ever. At least on the PC. Both versions of this level are so ball-bustingly bullshit, I genuinely have to wonder if they were ever tested. But before we get into the specifics, we have to find out what led us to this awful place. The Tantalus title actually takes a page out of the Blue Tongue game for a change by starting the final level off with a slideshow set in the giant sack of presents without explaining how the kids got there. To begin with, they don't even realise they're in the sack. It's only once it starts moving that they catch on. Then this little shit shows up, but he doesn't actually add anything to the conversation. And then because of all the added weight, the sack is too heavy and the zeppelin is going to crash. The kids aren't even controlling it. Technically we're playing as the elf pilot trying to keep the zeppelin in the air. Now, I could rip the fact four extra kids is too much weight for the zeppelin to handle when it's already carrying a house worth of presents. I could, but I'm not going to. Instead let's jump back to the blue tongue game. When we last left everyone, Chris was climbing up the ribbon at the top of the pile where Holly and Billy were waiting for him. So of course the very next we see of them, the sack has already been pulled up around the presents and the zeppelin has already taken flight. We get a shot of everyone looking out over the industrial nightmare world that is the North Pole and then it fades out. And when it fades back in, we're just on board the zeppelin. Also this little shit is here. He wasn't reintroduced in the film clip, so realistically they could have just left him out of this sequence. But no, something here has to be film accurate about apparently. Napoleon doesn't even seem to care that he's got four stowaways. The elves always knew they were there, but now that they're here, what's a little unpaid child labour between friends? That's right, even the elves are trying to force the kids to work. He keeps saying shit like, oh Santa's really counting on you. You don't want to let down Santa. Not on Christmas Eve. What a manipulative little bitch. Is one of you good with hammer vehicles? I think I could help you, Captain. Look, if you can't fly a Zeppelin by the age of nine, what are you even doing with your life? And then after the cutscene drags on for what feels like fucking hours, you're suddenly just in the game. Flying the Zeppelin. Good luck kid, Santa's counting on you. The same thing happens in the GBA game too, but it's even worse there, because before you even get the tutorial pop-up explaining the controls, the Zeppelin just nosedives into the fucking ground. And if you're not quick enough to catch it, you're going to take damage before the level even even starts. What is this? Genuinely the only way to avoid taking damage on spawn is to slap down a big old save state and reload already mashing the button to go higher. Alright, since we're here, let's stick with the Tantalus title, because some congratulations are in order. Kudos devs, you managed to make a shitty Flappy Bird clone nine years before it even released. Because that's literally all this is. You mash the button to make the Zeppelin go up, you let go and it falls back down. You find a balance to steer between obstacles, and that's it. Only it's somehow even worse because the Zeppelin has a giant hitbox and you're not just trying to reach the end of the level, you're trying to collect 30 fucking candy canes along the way. And of course you can't teabag them with the sack, they have to actually touch the zeppelin to be collected. Oh, and of course, of course, the devs put them in the most cursed places, in the most carcinogenic order. You have to swing up and down from the top of the screen to the bottom, trying to catch the 
poor little bastards, all the while dodging every obstacle in your path. And get this, the game expects you to do it at full speed. You can actually control how fast you go. In fact, I think you have to be moving quickly in order to dodge certain obstacles like you see here. I'm not even sure what hit me. I think the Zeppelin just had a heart attack and fucking died. I will say this for the level, it does look nice. The sprawl of red brick clock towers, spires and chimneys feels like less of a nightmare when done in 2D as part of a video game space. There's some attention to detail with how the level begins at the opened hangar from the film and ends at the Christmas tree in the centre of town too, but that's the only good thing about it. It's certainly not as tedious as all the platforming that preceded it, but fucking hell will it get your blood boiling. I spent most of this game either bored or irritated, but here I wanted to put my fist through the fucking screen. It's that bad. It's a terrible note on which to end an already pretty mediocre game. Blue Tongue's take on the level is arguably even worse, because it adds an extra axis of movement you need to deal with. And a time limit, because why not? No one's ever making it this far into the game, right? Go nuts, do whatever, who cares? We've got a deadline to hit. There is one other thing they added too. Sack physics. Sure, why not? I'm sure someone got a laugh out of this back in the day. <laughs> And I'll throw it a bone, it looks fine. I actually quite like the addition of this river and the boats that skate across its frozen surface, because it makes the North Pole feel a little more realistic and alive, but that's all the good I can say about it. This level is insidious. At first glance it seems easier because you're not required to constantly mash buttons to keep the zeppelin from slamming into the ground, and the speed at which you move is pretty leisurely, but the nice wide open space in which to fly doesn't last. The walls of the city crush in around the river and leave you with very little room to move, and they all look like they have enough space beneath them to fly through, but it is a trap. The zeppelin's hitbox is just as big as it was in the GBA game, if not bigger, and if you get caught trying to thread the needle past an obstacle, you might as well give up. The Zeppelin will just smash into the thing and then hang there taking contact damage while Chris has a meltdown at the helm. And even if you manage to break free, Santa's sack will probably still slap right onto the thing and end the fucking run anyway. I have to be more careful. The presents. I have to be more careful. The presents. I have to be more careful. But the absolute worst part of the level is when the Zeppelin leaves the river and starts flying through the streets of the North Pole. Sorry, did I say streets? I meant narrow alleyway. You cannot avoid taking damage here. The Zeppelin is going to hit one of the buildings, and when it does, it'll recoil and turn back to face camera forward, meaning as soon as it starts moving again, it's just going to hit another wall. So you try to turn it the other direction, which sends it into the opposite building, and now you're stuck. You're just fucking stuck, pinballing back and forth between these two houses in this impossible fucking turn. And even if you somehow escape and make it to a health pit, up now that you've started the cycle of pinballing back and forth, you're not making it out alive. I picked the damn thing up, I regained the health, and I still fucking died. It was right after my HP hit zero, but come on, the bar refilled. Let me keep going, don't make me do this shit again. Now you might very well be thinking, just take the Zeppelin higher out of the street so you don't bash into everything, but you can't, you just can't. This is as high as it'll go, and that's just bullshit. There is so much empty space in the sky here. Forcing you to stay low to the ground isn't just cruel, it doesn't even make sense. At least have the decency to fill the space with some Something to make taking the zeppelin up too dangerous to risk, like a field of balloons or some fucking birds or whatever. The GBA game's final level was just as shit, but at least it gave you the whole sky to fly through. Here it's like the zeppelin can't lift Santa's sack more than three meters off the ground. And even when you can take the high road, it keeps putting collectibles like coins and toy parts close to the ground as little traps to get you to give up the sky. The level ends at the Christmas tree at the centre of town, surrounded by a swarm of JPEG elves, although that's assuming you can make it past the final bridge. Anyway, now that we're at the Christmas tree, Napoleon takes back the helm so he can take all the credit for Chris getting the Zeppelin to Santa on time. Well done, young man. I salute you. Thanks, but well, we're not quite there yet. Don't you worry, I'll take it from here. Then Holly and Billy greet Chris like he was gone, even though they were standing right behind him the whole time? What? Hey! Welcome back! You made it! You saved the day! Could you have made the ride any more bumpy?
Shut the fuck up, you little shit. I swear to god I'm gonna rip your fucking jaw off and shove coal down your throat. Why are you here? The final cinematic begins with the kids back in the sack, as the Zeppelin drops it onto Santa's sleigh, naturally. The elves help them out, reiterating that they always knew the kids were there, but we only see Chris and Holly slip slide down to the conductor, so... Again, you could have left this little shit out of the entire scenario. But anyway, then Chris joins the conductor and the others, we get two shots of Santa as he takes off, and then this. You've got to be fucking kidding me. This has to be a mistake. You're telling me that in this Polar Express game, in a story where the whole fucking point is to meet up with Santa, we barely even see him? We certainly don't talk to him. He never gives Chris that stupid bell. His existential crisis is never resolved. They never even go home. I don't believe it. Fuck you, game. Okay, cutting out the denouement where they all go home, fine. It's clunky as hell, but I'll allow it. But you cannot cut the climax where Scrooge hides a bomb in Santa's sleigh. I mean, Chris meets Santa. Without that meeting with Santa, what's even the point of all this? What was the conflict even about? The Great Puppet War? That ended 40 fucking minutes ago. We might as well have cut to credits the second Scrooge died. I have to believe that a meeting with Santa got cut when Blue Tongue ran out of time. Because otherwise, I don't know why they bothered. I mean, I know why they bothered. The paycheck. But why put in all this effort to adapt the characters and the physical space of the Polar Express if you're not going to include its most important movie? Movement. Sorry, the script said moment, but for some reason I read it as movement, and honestly, now that I'm thinking about it, it seems more appropriate. Why have the game continue at all after Scrooge McPuppet's death? I don't even like the Polar Express, and now I find myself angry on its behalf because of how absolutely mangled this video game adaptation is. And sure, how do you adapt such an introspective, personal moment of a climax into something that's engaging to play, into something that isn't just a cutscene? Bitch, they found a way to shoehorn in hot chocolate, they could have done it here too. And making it a cutscene would have been perfectly fine. They could have just thrown it together from clips of the film, like they've been doing the entire game. They wouldn't even have to make any more assets or record any new dialogue. It's already there in the movie ready to go. You could probably get away with not setting it up at all, changing literally nothing else about the game, still have it end with an edited clip of Chris meeting Santa, and that would be enough to bring it home. But nope, I guess not. Not. The ending of the game did not need to be anything special, but it should have been something. I don't know, maybe there was a mandate from the filmmakers that said Blue Tongue couldn't use more than a certain number of minutes from the movie in the game. But even if that's the case, I think that's a shitty decision. And furthermore, if I'm right, they absolutely fucked it by using so much of the film earlier in the title. As usual, Tantalus gets it slightly better. The final slideshow is still a little out of order from what came before, but Santa actually shows up and Chris actually gets the stupid bell, and they actually have a bit of a conversation before Father Christmas fucks off and the conductor confirms the boy's belief by punching the word into his ticket. It's still a messy ending. It still cuts out a huge amount of stuff, but at least it is an ending. Even the credits are better. It's not just text over a black screen. You get this nice shot of the Polar Express rolling through the snow. The same one from the main menu. Hell, even the names are better. Eisenbice? Charles Batass? David S. Cohen? The Simpsons and Futurama writer? No, surely not. Anyway, I was so pissed off by the end of that final level, I never stopped to check what the Candy Canes even fucking did after all that. I think they just spell out believe on this ticket, in which case collecting them all was a giant waste of time. At least I took a moment to check what the toy parts were for. They unlock minigame versions of the game's levels from the main menu. So I was right. It is disappointing. There were a couple of extra minigames on the PS2 version that required an eye toy to play, but fuck that, I'm not doing that. I fucking bet one of them is the scene on the frozen lake though. Just to twist the knife even further. <sighs> and here we are, at the base of Mount Purgatory. Satan really clenched down hard on our way out, but that's all behind us now. We're here. It's over. We fucking made it. 
In his extremely bitter 1998 post-mortem of Trespasser published in Gama Sutra, now game developer, Richard Wyckoff said this of tie-in video games, quote, From my own perspective as a designer, licensed properties are the least fun games to work on. Even Star Wars, perhaps the only movie license just about any game maker might donate a limb to be allowed to use, brings with it a huge amount of restrictions which can make that initially attractive license turn into a lead weight over the course of development. From a game player's perspective, the vast majority of games with movie licenses have been just plain awful, end quote. Which, from what I've read, is probably true in many cases. And I doubt we'll ever know to the extent it was here, but at least with Star Wars or Jurassic Park or Men in Black or Alien or Indiana Jones, or even a lot of animated movies aimed at kids, you can watch them and understand how they might translate into a video game. With the Polar Express, there's just no nothing to hold on to. There's no friction to the conflict. It's completely smooth like the conductor's bald head. I've covered a lot of licensed games on this channel by this point, but I've never come across a media property that lends itself less to a video game adaptation. You can feel Blue Tongue Entertainment and Tantalus Media had the project dropped onto their plates and they collectively went, ah oh, fuck. Like, what do you do with it? You can't not make it. Both developers were dealt junk, but goddamn did they try their best to bluff their way to a royal flush. Tantalus's 2D side-scroller for the Game Boy Advance had a solid gameplay loop and a couple of fun gimmick levels, but is bogged down by the absurd amount of collectibles and lack of mechanical variety. It's not a long game, but like I said, even at 2 hours and 45 minutes, it more than outstayed its welcome. Blue Tongue's 3D minigame Extravaganza did a good job of adapting the Polar Express as a space to explore, and was at least bad in an interesting way most of the time. But at its worst, playing the game felt like ripping out your thumbnail with a pair of tweezers. I feel sorry for them getting stuck with such an impossible task, but my sympathies lie far more with anyone unlucky enough to get either lump of coal for Christmas back in 2004. I remember seeing it on the shelf at my local electronics boutique back at the time and thinking, how do you even make a game out of that? Even as a kid, I knew it would be shit, I just didn't know how bad it would stink. After I finished the games, I went online to search up old reviews and articles from the time of release. But there's only one I want to talk about here. A review by Matt Casamassina for IGN. And you are not going to believe this, but he didn't think it was very good. He gave it a 3.5, the lowest score IGN has ever given, I assume. And the score was given for all the same reasons I've been talking about this whole video. But I bring up the review because it opens with this line, quote, This is a self-serving review. We had to write it or our superiors might have fired us, mind you. But really, deep down, we know that this is one of the fun ones. Let's be clear, not to play, but to write about, end quote. And yeah, that's pretty much why I'm here too. I think we all knew going into this video that neither of these games would turn out to be forgotten classics. The source material was always going to end up mangled beyond recognition, to say nothing of how far away they are from the original book. But finding out just how much, that's all part of the fun. You don't watch movies like Hellraiser to see the characters make good decisions. You watch them to see the characters open the puzzle box so Pinhead can rip them apart. You know it's a bad idea. They know it's a bad idea. I knew it was a bad idea. But sometimes you just have to know. How do you adapt the Polar Express into a video game? And oh, what sights we have seen today. I still don't get the appeal of the Polar Express. I don't think I ever will. But I do know this for certain. A part of my soul will remain trapped on this rattler for the rest of eternity, riding the rails with the Conductor, the Hobo, and Scrooge McPuppet as they ferry kids to a frozen hell at the top of the world to be sacrificed at the foot of a giant Christmas tree. Because for all its nightmare fuel flaws, there's something captivating about it. No matter how hard you try, you just can't look away. It's a train wreck. Wait, this motherfucker wrote Jumanji? And that's the video. I hope you enjoyed taking this trip through hell with me. I certainly had a lot of fun acting as Virgil or Pinhead or the Conductor, whichever one you think is most appropriate here. This project kind of got away from me toward the end, but hey, what else is new? If you're going to do it, you might as well do it right. Speaking of projects getting away from me, the next big video is going to be the Trespasser Critique, so look out for that soon. And since I'm here, I just want to say thanks for a great 2023. It's been incredible to see the channel grow in subs and views so much, 
and I'm very grateful for every single one, sincerely. Anyway, I think I've ruined Christmas for myself this year, but happy holidays. I hope everyone has a pleasant end to the year, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Okay, so you beat me. Get going already.